for this legacy, we commit to being stewards of the natural environment and undertake to have a relationship of respect with our treaty partners. So if everybody can take a moment of silence to consider um, where we are today and uh, just to reflect on things, that would be great. Thank you, everybody. So we're going to get into the agenda uh, and keep moving. So I'd like to resolve that the agenda for the meeting uh, of 123 be adopted. Um, do we have uh, a mover and a seconder for that? Sarah, thank you. Uh, Pat, thank you very much. Um, are there any questions, changes, observations, additions uh, to those minutes? We're all good? OK, nothing? Great, thank you. Uh, number two, uh, is there any declaration of pecuniary interest in the nature thereof? Seeing none, I will move on. Okay, um, approval of the minutes of the uh, SPA meeting of uh, 222 from April 22. Um, it's uh, resolved that the minutes of the meeting uh, be adopted as circulated. Can I have a mover and a seconder? Uh, Pat, thank you very much. Uh, Pam, thank you, and a seconder for that. Sure. Thank, Thank you very much. Kriya. Kriya. I'm sorry. Yeah, I know you know. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Kriya. <laughs> sorry. Thank you for correcting yeah. that. Um, okay. Uh, can I have a vote on that, please? Passed. Any questions um, for the minutes themselves? Okay. Um, do we have any business arising from the minutes? No? All right. If there's nothing there, I will move on to the presentation um, of the Clean Water Act and the Source Protection Planning. Uh, okay. I'll have you. Okay. To share it to. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, so just to provide kind of a brief overview of what the program is and why you're all here today. Um, we have a bit of a presentation to go over what the scope of the source water protection program is, what the program components are, including some of the background documents and reference material that have gone into the development of the program, what your role as the source protection authority board of directors is, and then a brief update on the timelines of the implementation of the program and where we're at. So just as a brief up overview, uh, the Clean Water Act resulted from the Walkerton tragedy, which occurred uh, almost 23 years ago now, back in May of 2000. Uh, to date, it was Canada's worst E. coli outbreak with seven fatalities and uh, over 2,300 illnesses. There was about $200 million spent to date uh, as a result of that tragedy. And the Walkerton inquiry was the biggest thing that came out of that tragedy, which was uh, completed by Justice O'Connor, resulting in 21 recommendations um, for the province. So some of those recommendations included a multi-barrier approach to protecting municipal drinking water sources, these uh, would result in reliable treatment systems, sound distribution systems, including testing and monitoring of all the water throughout the system, plans to deal with any adverse situations that may arise, as well as protecting the drinking water at the source. And those all together form up that multi-barrier approach. So what is source water? That's what we refer to untreated water either coming from rivers, streams, or lakes, or any underground aquifers, which then get distributed through a well, uh, well system. So the source protection program is all based on the Clean Water Act. So that the main goal of the Clean Water Act is to protect all of our surface water and groundwater systems from contamination and overuse, both now and into the future. The Clean Water Act itself was written and passed in 2006 with the regulations, including the general regulation being passed in 2007. 
There were six regulations that were passed under the Clean Water Act. Uh, for the most part, we operate under the general regulation uh, for, the, for the Source Water Protection Program. And again, it's protecting groundwater and surface water from contamination both now and in the future. A quick summary of where we are in the program and how it has evolved over the years. So you'll see on the left hand side in May of 2000 was the Walkerton incident, uh, resulting in some inquiries beginning in 2002. The legislation was drafted in 2004 with all of it coming into effect in 2007. In 2008, we started the background work for the program itself with the uh, production of the watershed characterization reports and the formation of our local source protection authorities and source protection regional committees. In 2011, the building code was amended to address source water protection concerns as well for septic systems in vulnerable areas around municipal drinking water systems. Then in July of 2013, local threat verification was completed on all the properties that are within vulnerable areas around municipal drinking water sources. And then in October of 2014, our local source protection plan was approved. So that came into effect on January 1st of 2015. And since then, we've been working through implementation and now going through some updates to all of those background documents and the source protection plan itself. This is a high level summary of the source protection regions that occur across the province. You'll see ours is outlined in red there. We are the Trent Conservation Coalition Source Protection Region. We are one of, if not the largest source protection region in the province, and we are made up of five individual source protection areas. So just a close up of our source protection region. As I mentioned, there's five source protection areas that make up the region, including Crow Valley, Ganaraska, ourselves, Lower Trent and Autonomy Conservation. And we also pull in some areas that are outside of traditional conservation authority jurisdiction that are from Halliburton County, which is why we have some lo lovely representatives from our member municipalities in Halliburton County here today. Uh, then there's also some areas in Peterborough County and Havelock, Belmont, Methune and Trent Lakes, or sorry, Trent Hills. As I mentioned, we're very multi-jurisdictional. There are five upper tier counties, 32 uh, municipalities as a whole, as well as four First Nations, including a federal waterway. We have a very diverse geography from the Canadian Shield and Bedrock to deep soils. There are three major watershed groupings, which are the Trent River, the Lake of the Ontario, and the Bay of Quinte. And we, I'm sure as you're all familiar with, have a very diverse land use across our region from agriculture to mining and aggregates, forestry, seasonal use for cottages and urbanizing areas. Uh, there's also in our region, 35 municipal drinking water wells and 18 municipal surface water supply systems that together comprise over servicing over 50% of the population um, or just under 50%. So this is our source protection area um, specifically. As you can see, we do have uh, jurisdiction with, um, within the city of Kawartha Lakes. There's some within Peterborough County, which pulls in um, Cabin Monaghan and Trent Lakes. There is some up in Halliburton County as well, including Minden Hills, Dysart, uh, Algonquin Highlands and the Highlands East. And then there's the region of Durham, which pulls in areas of Brock, Scugog and Uxbridge Townships. Our source protection area has 12 municipalities that are members, including one First Nations Reserve and the federal waterway being the Trent Severn. Again, we have a very diverse geography of Precambrian Shield, Paleozoic Bedrock, and thick overburden of the Oak Ridges Moraine down to the south. We have the Gull River, Burnt River, and the Western Kawartha Lakes watersheds. And again, we've got that same diverse land use of agriculture, mining and aggregates, forestry, seasonal use, and urban areas. There are six municipal surface water systems in our source protection area and 16 municipal drinking water well systems that are comprised of 29 individual wells. There are less than 28 and a half square kilometers of land that is actually located in those vulnerable areas. So even though they service a large amount of the population, the number of landowners affected is actually quite low. And they service approximately 45% of the population uh, from the 22 residential drinking water systems. So just a quick summary of the steps that have gone into the creation of the plan and where we are now. So all of the stuff that happened in stage one was the planning work 
that established our short source protection authorities, set who the chairs are for the source protection committees, established the source protection committees themselves, which are those regional bodies, and they also negotiated the terms of reference for the work plans. In stage two, we identified and assessed the drinking water threats and considered any physical land conditions and land uses. And we also prepared the assessment reports, which are all of the background documents that went into the protection plan. Stage three was the production of the source protection plan itself, which I identified and addressed all the significant drinking water threats. And it was based on all of the science that went into the assessment report and was written in compliance with the Clean Water Act. And now we're in stage four of taking action. So implementing all of those policies in the source protection plan, inspecting and enforcing all of those policies, monitoring and reporting on our progress of the program, reviewing the plan and completing any updates as necessary. For the administrative structure of the program as a whole, our oversight is done and we receive all of our guidance from the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, that then goes to our local regional source protection committee, being in this case our Trent Conservation Coalition Source Protection Committee. Uh, the source protection authority boards are the ones that come in below that, uh, and you guys are responsible for helping with the plan process and some of the implementation of the policies within that plan. We then have municipal working groups, which have input to the policies and the implementation direction of all of those policies in the source protection plan. They're comprised of local municipal staff who are actually the ones working with and implementing the policies. The Trent Conservation Coalition also has regional input and technical management from the five member conservation authorities and local municipal staff. And then there's also various other stakeholders who had input into the plan. Our source protection committee is comprised of 28 representatives, including the chair, seven of which are municipal representatives. They are predominantly elected officials. However, uh, some are, are actual municipal staff. It was left up to each individual source protection authority if they wanted them to be elected officials or municipal staff. Uh, there's three agricultural reps, four business reps. They come from industry, recreation, aggregates, and economic development. There are four public reps. They are, there's an urban rep, a rural rep, waterfront property owners rep, and an environmental rep. There are three First Nations representatives on the committee, two drinking water experts, one expert from Trent Severn Waterway, and then there are three non-voting liaisons. So those are the SPA, the ministry, and the local health unit. So the Source Protection Authority, um, as you guys know, your municipal representatives, um, sometimes from outside of our uh, Conservation Authority watersheds, hence the members from Halliburton County, uh, and you're also our traditional Conservation Authority Board of Directors. So some of your key roles and responsibilities in the program are initiating the source protection planning process, so assisting with SPC chair nominations and SPC member selection, as uh, that's one of the upcoming agenda items. Uh, the administrative stuff and technical reports to the SPC, uh, you'll also have play a role in that. You will help coordinate the preparation of the source protection plan deliverables, including consolidating comments on plan deliverables and any amendments or updates that are proposed to those uh, protection planning documents. You will be submitting uh, source protection plan deliverables to the ministry or assisting us in doing so. You will be liaising with the province and various stakeholders and bringing any information uh, between them and us. And you also assist with the implementation and submission of the annual progress reports. Municipalities themselves, they fit into the program as they actually own and operate the drinking water systems. They do have a strong role in developing and implementing the policies in the source protection plans. And they are actually responsible for implementing many of the policies within the plan. Therefore, they do have direct input into the planning policies themselves uh, by having representatives on the source protection committee. They can have representatives on our source protection authority board of directors. They are always on our municipal working groups and they are also a commenting agency when we're working through amendments. Uh, the overview of the source protection program, uh, there's really three major deliverables um, that also have implementation activities associated with them. The terms of reference, it was completed back in January of 2009. The completion of the assessment report was done in 2011. The completion of the source protection plan was done in October of 2014 with an implementation date of January 1st of 2015, which is where we are now. 
So we are in the implementation phase of the annual progress report submission, which was completed in 2018, as dictated by the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks guidance that we were given. We were given three years to submit our first annual progress report. We now submit ongoing annual progress reports once a year. Those are due on February 1st of each year. And we are updating the source protection documents as well, which has begun in 2018 and is continuing on until now. The terms of reference just briefly outlined the work that needed to be under, undertaken as uh, part of completing the source protection plan and the assessment report. As I mentioned before, the assessment report outlines all of the technical foundations for the source protection plan, including the delineation of all vulnerable areas and an enumeration of all of the drinking water threats on the landscape. There is a source protection plan, which as outlined, uh, it contains the specific policies that are protecting the drinking water sources so that uh, they aren't contaminated or overused now or into the future. They also have other policies and actions to ensure that municipal systems are protected. And we are working through the implementation. So um, we're responsible for identifying and implementing agencies throughout the source protection plan and making sure that they're carrying out the policies that they are responsible for, as well as support it, or submitting the reports to the ministry, the annual reports. Just a quick little graphic of what our local uh, source protection documents look like. So this is just a quick look at what some of the vulnerable, vulnerable areas around municipal drinking water systems look like. On the left is an intake protection zone. That one specifically is Kinmount. Um, it, for a surface water intake protection zone, you'll see there's a little yellow dot um, in the middle of the red area. That's where the intake is within the water course. And there's a vulnerable area that's delineated out around each of those municipal intakes. Um, and on the right hand side, you'll see it's a municipal wellhead protection area. So those two little green dots, they are the wells. Uh, this one is Mariposa Estates um, down towards Ugog a little bit. Um, so there's zones that are delineated out around from all of the wells themselves. Uh, they're typically in four zones, the wellhead protection area A, B, C, and D. And I don't think I go into a lot of detail about that in a further slide. So the going back to the intake protection zones, uh, the red area is the intake protection zone one. It is uh, an area that's generated one kilometer upstream and downstream of the intake itself. And then where it makes landfall, it goes in 120 meters, which is why there's a little bit of a buffer around the land there you'll see. And then the blue area is the intake protection zone two. It is defined as a two hour time of travel for all water bodies, storm sewers, um, ditches, whatever it might be that feed into that main water body. So um, they've all been modeled using some complex science and modeling uh, to determine that anything that happens on the landscape in that blue area would take roughly two hours to reach the well or the intake itself and then get sucked up into the treatment system. Um, so it allows time for if there is an emergency on the landscape there to shut down the drinking water system from taking water and distributing it should it be contaminated. The wellhead protection areas, the wellhead protection area A is always a 100 meter radius around the wells itself. The wellhead protection area B, they're also done on a time of travel, however they're done in years and not hours. Um, so the wellhead protection area B is a two year time of travel, so that indicates that any contaminant that should spill on the landscape would take roughly two years to percolate through the soil column, get into the aquifer and get then into the water treatment system and distribution system. The wellhead protection area C is a five year time of travel and the wellhead protection area D is a 25 year time of travel. And there are some, uh, the little spotted area there on the map, it indicates a transport pathway and that essentially would be a short circuit to that drinking water system. So it could be deep wells or deep excavations that would cause um, any contaminants in those areas to get into the aquifer much quicker than whatever the traditional time zone, um, time frame is for that zone. For our source protection plan, there's a range of tools that go from less restrictive to more restrictive, and these are what the policies, um, how they enforce the policies. So they range from education and outreach to incentive programs to land planning approaches, so things that the municipalities do, such as their official plans and their zoning bylaws. There are prescribed instruments. Those are ministry approvals, such as ECAs. 
And then we get into the more restrictive ones, which are defined under part four of the Clean Water Act. They are the ones that the risk management officials are responsible for implementing. They include restricted land use notices, risk management plans or interim risk management plans. And then on the, the most restrictive side is prohibitions. So to give you an idea of what our local uh, source protection plan policies look like, these are just an example of an agriculture policy. You'll see at the top, we have a table that quickly summarizes the threats themselves and what vulnerable areas they apply in. There is a list of all of the applicable activities that are considered agriculture threats. Those are defined within the Clean Water Act. So they're listed there for quick reference. We then in the table at the bottom have our policy numbers, the policy tools, which range from uh, the PRO is a prohibition, RMP is risk management plan, and at the bottom, the PI is that prescribed instrument. And you'll see that for the prescribed instruments, that's an approval from a ministry, a provincial ministry. Um, and then the other ones are implemented by the risk management official. The column that has an E or an F in it, those stand for existing or future. In this case, all of these policies are future ones. And one thing to note is that in our Trent Source Protection Plan, we only prohibit future occurrences. So if there's an activity currently happening on the landscape, we work with the landowner to allow them to continue that. We don't prohibit ex any existing threats or activities. Um, then we get into the policy text, which is really the meat and potatoes of what uh, us as risk management officials do. Um, they really guide what we do and how we do it. And then there's a monitoring policy, which often is just the requirement for annual reporting. So this is an example of uh, overall. This is the uh, zone itself, the wellhead protection area as a whole. And then that's the only portion that policies apply to. So as I mentioned before, it's only a, a small number of landowners in the overall area, wellhead protection area or intake protection zone to which these policies apply. So <laughs> moving through implementation, um, right now there are in our source protection plan policies, all of the agencies which are responsible for implementation have been identified. They range from the source protection authority, so you guys, our conservation authority, all of our member municipalities, all of the provincial governments, there's five of them that are represented in our source protection plans, as well as risk management officials and risk management inspectors. So in the city of Kawartha Lakes, they have delegated all of their risk management official duties to a staff member at Kawartha Conservation. It's actually myself. I function as the city of Kawartha Lakes risk management official and risk management inspector. However, two of our other member municipalities being the township of Minden Hills and the region of Durham, they retained their risk management official and risk management inspector authorities. So it's municipal staff who carry out those duties. So for implementation, just a quick overview, you guys as highlighted in yellow are responsible at this point for doing annual reporting as are all other implementing bodies. The sewage policies are implemented by the municipality risk management officials, as well as the province. Uh, most agricultural policies are implemented by the risk management official or the province if there's things um, like a nutrient management strategy that needs to be issued. For fuels and chemical storage, it's only the risk management official. The road salt and waste policies are done by either the municipality, the risk management official, or the province. For non-agricultural source material or agricultural source material policies, it's the risk management official and the province. There are monitoring policies for things like those transport pathways that we talked about earlier. Those are done by the municipality or the province. There's education and outreach, which is done by uh, mostly the municipality. However, they can delegate to their local risk management official like myself. And then there's other policies such as signage or incentive programs, emergency response provisions, climate change data, land acquisition, et cetera. Those are done by either the conservation authority, the municipality or the province. So for the implementation timeline, uh, there's just some several, several key timeline items that need to be identified. So for example, February 1st of each year, all of those implementing bodies have to have their annual reports completed and submitted to the Source Protection Authority, uh, including all provincial ministries. So we do get reports back from the provincial ministries. By May 1st, each local source protection region compiles all of their annual reporting and submits the final report back to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. 
Within three years, all provincial agencies had to review all of their nutrient management plans, pesticide permits, and other prescribed instruments. So we're past that now. That has been completed by all of our uh, ministry representatives. Within five years of the source protection plan implementation, the risk management official had to have all of the risk management plans in place. Now, due to the pandemic, we did receive a two-year extension to those. Um, we have them pretty well done. There's a couple of outstanding ones, but uh, we can address those a little bit later in our annual report. And the municipality had to have all of their complex updates done to the official plan and their zoning bylaws, um, which happens usually around the five-year time frame. Just the source water day-to-day, -day, how the program functions, the role of the municipalities is to receive applications and screen them for their applicability or their location within vulnerable areas, forwarding any that fall within those vulnerable areas onto their local risk management official for review. A risk management official will receive any planning or building code applications within any of those vulnerable areas, review them for compliance with the policies and either issue a prohibition, require a risk management plan or issue a restricted land use notice which allows the activity to uh, go ahead uh, with, with no other restrictions. And they also negotiate those risk management plans that we talked about. And the risk management plans there, for the most part, um, just a negotiation with the person who's engaged in the activity on the landscape, outlining what the threat they're engaged in is, outlining all of their existing risk management measures that are protecting their drinking water source, and then also including any additional risk management measures that would be required to make sure that their drinking water source is protected. As Source Protection Authority staff, we are also implementing bodies, so we coordinate all of our annual reporting. We support our member municipalities in completing their responsibilities under the Clean Water Act and the annual reporting. We collect information on any implementation challenges from any of our implementing bodies, and we coordinate some updates that the guiding documents the Source Protection Plan go through as well. And we also help system owners or operators go through upgrades, decommissioning processes, or amendments to their drinking water systems. For this year, 2023 and onward, just a quick summary of the activities, some of the key high-level activities that we will be doing and focusing our energies on. We are working through a section 36 under the Clean Water Act. That is a work plan we were required to submit by the director of the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. Uh, and it captures all of the amendments that are required as the director's technical rules have been updated. So that's some of that guidance document that comes down from the ministry themselves. We also had identified through our previous first five years of implementation, some challenges resulting from the wording of some of the policies. We're revising those policies and that's contained in these documents as well. Um, and any amended systems that need to be captured in the assessment report or explanatory documents, those changes will be captured in that amendment package as well. We have gone through early engagement with the ministry uh, as that engagement process has been prescribed as well in the legislation. They were happy with our amendment package. So starting, uh, we anticipate in May, we will be doing pre-consultation uh, which is a consultation with a prescribed list of implementing bodies and people affected by the policies and documents themselves, and yourselves included, um, to provide any, it's your opportunity to first provide any feedback or concerns, questions you have on the amendments, the proposed policies as worded. We then go through a prescribed public consultation as well, which we're anticipating starting in September. Uh, which allows anybody to um, access those amendments as proposed and provide feedback. So we're anticipating the submission of our completed amendment package to the ministry for final approval at the end of 2023. We are working through the annual progress reports, which need to be submitted for our region by May 1st. So this is the first step in that later on today. Hopefully you'll be approving our watershed annual report, which will then get rolled into the Trent regional report. Uh, we are working through the selection of municipal representatives to sit on the source protection committee um, so that there's a process outlined that Mark actually will be speaking to later in this agenda package. And then we're also uh, continuing with ongoing public education and outreach efforts. So those are done through our presence at public events, social media posts, development and circulation of information pam pam pamphlets, etc. Is there any questions about the program overall as a whole? Through you, Mr. Chair. Absolutely. Through you, Chair. <laughs> this is going to be a delicate question. 
the balance between staff and elected reps? Are the, I'm guessing there's pros and cons to both. I'm wondering if the continuity works for having staff, but then there's chances of staff changing from one to the other because of movement in, in employment. So on the whole, how does that work for this committee? Does, is that a... Yeah, I think uh, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, um, I've had some experience. Jenna's got more recent experience with source water, but uh, I was the lead before before Jenna was. Uh, while we're going through the uh, through the whole uh, kind of setup of source water, um, and what I've seen is uh, it's a mix, right? Realistically, so we do have one staff person that uh, that's been appointed to the Source Protection Committee from I think it's Port Hope, uh, if I remember right. He's a planner uh, by trade. And, uh, and so he's been on the committee since it began. Uh, so kind of long-term employee provides some stability on that end. Uh, and the rest of the representatives, representatives are all uh, municipal elected officials. Uh, and we see that there, there can be some you know, good stability there as well, like four years uh, for sure. Um, and beyond that, it just depends on whether uh, they're reelected and whether or not there's some uh, uh, some responsibility changes in, in the mix. So, you know, if they, uh, for instance, are a counselor and become a mayor, uh, for instance, then the question is, uh, can they still spend the time to, to, uh, to do both? And I know that's actually a, a situation that's before us right now is uh, uh, the mayor of the city of Kortha Lakes uh, was successful, of course, in his bid for, for mayorship. Um, and he's, uh, he's currently looking at whether or not he can sustain uh, you know, both roles. Uh, so, um, and that's why we haven't uh, addressed that particular element uh, in the emails to, uh, to all municipalities at this point is just, there's no uh, nomination for a second person yet uh, at this point in time um, to, uh, to kind of serve in, in his shoes. Uh, but uh, so there is four years where there's stability uh, with municipal elected officials, maybe, maybe more. Uh, or four. That's four now. Sorry, I'm getting a little confused. It used to be three. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, potential for, you know, multiples of four uh, at that point in time if, uh, if the individual still wants to continue on this committee. Um, and with staff, uh, you know, there can be stability or it could be uh, just depends on, on how um, how long term they are with, uh, with the particular municipality. In terms of um, in terms of providing advice to uh, to the source protection committee, um, I think both are good. Uh, so, although we only have one member that is a, a staff member, uh, he provides a lot of practical um, experience in terms of how this plays out, and that's been really beneficial for for the committee. And on the flip side, with municipal elected representatives, uh, they represent everyone. Uh, so, there's uh, some really good perspectives in terms of what works, uh, you know, some, a different look at the practical, um, which is uh, looking at uh, costing, looking at, because uh, the costs are borne by municipalities ultimately on the, on the policies, um, and looking at uh, the, the community base, uh, for instance, as well, and then the, just the breadth of experience being, uh, being counselors. So, uh, so they, they complement each other, I think, fairly well. Any other questions for Jenna on this? Good. Just caught me kind of surprising <clears throat> for the intake point on the waterway. It's the same distance upstream and downstream. That kind of surprised me. What's the logic behind that? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, it's to accommodate any backflow that may happen in a flood situation. Um, so sometimes it'll be cut short if there's a dam or an impoundment structure that would stop that from, you know, continuing on. But I believe that was the background science was yeah. the flood situations for uh, backflows. Any other questions? Um, thank you. Through the chair, I'd like to ask a little bit more depth on the source protection plan slide, slide number, which is on our documents, it's page 29. And it talks about land use planning approaches in both the existing tools and the CWA part four powers. Can you explain it, that a bit more? Is it this, this? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So the restricted land uses, um, that is an, when myself as a risk management official, when the municipality is in receipt of a development application, whether it's under the Planning Act or the Building Act, I receive that development application as long as it falls within a, one of those vulnerable areas around a municipal drinking water system. I then review it for compliance with all of the existing drinking water threats 
and all of the existing policies. So as long as it aligns with those policies, it goes through with no problem. I then issue what's called a restricted land use notice that says that there's no restrictions or prohibitions or required risk management plan for that proposed development. Um, that's what 99% of the ones that I have done are. There was one instance where it required a risk management plan before that development could go forward. Um, so that would be if there was a proposed activity that triggered some or fell under one of those significant drinking water threat uh, categories that uh, then required some management to allow it to proceed. Um, so that one didn't require a prohibition um, and it hasn't happened yet, but the possibility is very real that I receive a proposal that's in one of those more vulnerable areas for large chemical storage or something to that nature that would require to be prohibited. That's where that would get flagged and that development would stop at that point. They could then revisit or revise their development proposal or if possible, move the chemical storage or whatever activity was being prohibited out of that most vulnerable area to where it would just require some management practices. Um, but that's really where all of the landowner review applications come in through the risk management official. And those are screened and intook by the municipality and then circulated to the local risk management official. Thank you for that. And, then yeah. the, and the difference between the land use restricted and the two different sections we found there, the CWA part four versus the existing tools. So the, through you, Mr. Chair, the you mean the land use planning approaches? Yes. Or? Yeah, so the land use planning approaches, those are those municipal sorry, ones that are, sorry. yeah, they're the official plan and zoning bylaw. Those are the, the second part, the restricted land uses, that's what you were speaking about. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Those are only under the part four, the risk management officials' duties. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you, and through you. Um, you mentioned something I wasn't quite sure I heard it about activities already in place aren't being looked at or asked to change, but new. Uh, the easels work. Could yeah, you on that? through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the existing activities aren't being prohibited. So those are the ones that we manage through risk management plans. So if there's already a farmer engaged in something that would be considered a significant drinking water threat, we don't go in and tell them you need to stop, you know, operating your farm in this manner. We work with them and say, okay, you have your livestock, they're fenced out of this waterway. That's great. We don't need to ask that of you. Um, we might have them move where their manure pile is stored, uh, if there's a possibility for it to be stored outside of one of those more vulnerable areas. Um, but for the most part, yeah, in the Trent plan, we don't prohibit any existing activities. It would just be any proposed for the future. So say they have a farm that has um, cash cropping, so application of fertilizer and pesticide. Um, if they now are proposing to use it for livestock, that may be prohibited because it wasn't an existing use. Um, or similarly, similarly, if a uh, previous example, if somebody wanted to have or develop a, a property right beside a municipal well that had storage of large volumes of chemicals for industry, that's something we would prohibit as opposed to managing it if it was already there. Great. Um, and one more question. Um, how do you, how does it work between farmers and this committee? I mean, do you go out on the land and approach farmers or? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, I have approached and uh, spoken with and negotiated all the risk management plans with the farmers who have, or the tenants, because it's the person engaged in the activity, uh, that are engaged in activities in those vulnerable areas. Um, all of my risk management plans have been signed off on, so everybody was amenable to work with me. Um, I've never uh, required a prohibition of anything on a farm, um, and I don't think I've even required any additional risk management measures to be in place, because for the most part, farmers are doing everything properly to protect the landscape and the water as it is. So yes, I have already dealt with all of our, our member farmers. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Thanks. Fantastic amount of information. I just want to ask a follow-up. So if a place has been flagged, for example, it, it's a farming operation that would theoretically be outside of what the expectation is, and you've gone through some whatever risk uh, mitigations can happen right now, is that property then flagged when we're talking about future development? If someone was to sell, wanting to sell the farm, uh, would it be flagged that the preference would be through sale, that operation wouldn't continue. So if I'm looking to buy the farm and I want to continue that operation, would that be a point by which we could, I guess, have more oomph to what we can do from a risk mitigation if it is transitioning hands, but not necessarily transitioning use? 
Yeah, so through yourself, Mr. Chair. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it is. Um, there are some varying opinions on that okay. even within our region. Mm -hmm. um, I would consider the activity, I mean, because people often buy farms to continue farming right. them. Exactly. Um, so that's, and also it's hard because unless they do some due diligence or the real estate agent who I've done lots of uh, education and outreach to local real estate agents, hopefully they're contacting me saying, I have a client who's interested in purchasing this property. Mm -hmm. We've identified it's in one of those vulnerable areas what can they do can they continue operating it mm -hmm. um i would probably allow them to continue operating it as a farm but i would have to negotiate a new risk management plan because it has to be done you can't transfer them between landowners or tenants to a landowner or, or whatever um, if it was a complete change in use away from agriculture into development for commercial or industrial uses then we would definitely prohibit certain activities on the land, but if it's the same land use, I personally would allow that to continue. Um, unless of course they were changing from cash crop into livestock or right. livestock to something that hadn't been done before. That's when we would kind of look at that. But if it's the exact same operation, I would keep it the same, yeah. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so, okay. Chair, on that note, so as some of these municipalities grow mm -hmm. and then they need a super well to supplement what they already had prior to, and now they put the super well at a distance and pipe it back, where they put the super well, who gets preference? The fellow that was operating there as a farm before they put the super well in, or the community that has pulled water out of the ground in that to create a, a the hundred whatever boundary, right? Yeah. So through you, Mr. Chair, there would have to be then new vulnerable areas delineated around whatever that new system is, the new well or whatever it may be. Um, and those landowners would then be affected by these policies. Um, so we in our watershed haven't had a situation where we've had a new well that's pulled in new landowners. Uh, I know some of our neighbors over in Durham region are dealing with that right now. Um, and they're having some, I think it is actually farmers for them that are now impacted by some new wells that were put in to increase the water supply for a community. Um, I don't know, I don't know that they prohibit those farmers from continuing their operations. I don't think they would. I think they would then just need those risk management plans in place. But yeah, those um, um, that would result in policies applying to landowners who are not currently regulated by those policies and or impacted by the Clean Water Act in any way. That's why I'm curious about who'd have the, the priority. Like you grandfather because you were there and now we've created this new problem, new situation. Because in our township, we have some super wells drilled years ago with one plan in motion and it got screwed up and they changed the plan, but there's now talk that that might come back into play at some point. Okay. So I'm just wondering if if a person that's running an art, uh, a working farm mm -hmm. is drove out of business because of something like that or impacted drastically, are there any safeguards for them? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, they would be allowed, I, I think, I, I, we wouldn't prohibit just based on a new well, right? Yeah, I think uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's uh, it's a, it's a very important and kind of complex question at the same yeah. time. Uh, but I think boiled down, it would amount to a couple of things. Uh, one is the assessment by, uh, by the municipality as they're kind of searching for a new well. And source water is a piece of that. So, uh, so you'd want, the municipality would want to take a look at uh, at uh, one water supply, uh, make sure there's enough to facilitate what they're what they're you know trying to achieve uh, with uh, serving a population. The second is uh, how how many um, people are affected by that, which then translates into the policies and uh, municipalities are responsible for uh, creating the assessments. Uh, so some of the fancy maps that you saw earlier, that's now part of uh, the municipal process to generate those, so they'll know how many landowners are affected. And the third piece is it goes through a very extensive uh, process uh, to make sure that there is a mm -hmm. location for, for new landowners that might be affected and uh, an ability to submit comments uh, for, uh, for consideration. So, so there is a, a big, a big okay. piece to that. Yeah. We're good. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, just, I have one other question. I mean, obviously, when we we're looking at the source protection program itself, um, you indicate that you know municipalities own and uh, operate the municipal drinking systems, um, but also we know that according to the report, over fifty percent are on private wells. What is that sort of? you know, the education process or the protection of, like, uh, is there education programs available to private well owners on how to m sort of maximize the, <laughs> or minimize the risks that they have to their own 
private well systems. Yeah, so through you, Mr. Chair, they're not covered under the Clean Water Act right. as it is written, mm -hmm. um, but all of the best management practices, so all of those education and outreach materials, all of our information that we share at public events, all of those would translate very well onto private landowners, people with private intakes. Mm -hmm. um, they could apply all of those measures themselves, such as getting their septics pumped on regularly and inspected regularly, um, you know, making sure that their oil tanks aren't dripping in their houses or putting a drip tray underneath them, um, you know, things like that. A lot of that does apply to those private right. landowners as well. However, we don't have any authority to actually impose those on those private property owners. But. Okay, that is great. Thank you very much. Yes, yep. thank you to the chair again, and questions continue. <laughs> um, there's, there's a movement, if you will, for more housing, of course, thank God, um, that also might include cluster housing, where you might have several uh, houses on a small system. So we don't really cover in this the uh, individuals, our my own well and septic system, for example, mm -hmm. being rural, mm -hmm. um, but we would include our down our settlement areas. So where would those places be? Would they be within this coverage? If we let's say we have twenty homes that are using the same septage and um, water system, or where does that fit in? Yes, yeah. we work towards that legislation of trying to build more housing in different ways and not just look at settlement areas, mm -hmm. but cluster homes with services. Where does that fit between the private and the and this program? Right, so through you, Mr. Chair, uh, currently they would be addressed under the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is outside of what this committee's role is. Uh, but I believe the well clusters, they do have an option to opt into the Clean Water Act, correct? Uh, through municipal resolution. Yeah. yeah, so it would have to be, you know, required or, or requested by the municipality, um, but that they could opt into the program and then be subject to the same type of uh, restrictions and policies. And may I ask, do you as the staff, if they have a recommendation, if you have a recommendation on? Those, yeah, um, for you, Mr. Chair, that's a, that's a very, um, that's one that I think was wrestled with at the very beginning of the source uh, protection process in terms of which, municip uh, which municipalities would want to include cluster, uh, areas. So there's a number of historic settlements that kind of apply to that. Right now, the Clean Water Act says, uh, is it five, six, six mm. homes, six residential homes, and it is actually serviced by the municipality is, is the guideline. Uh, so uh, if it doesn't meet that criteria, it doesn't hit the Clean Water Act. So you can imagine there's lots of things that don't, uh, uh, communal places like churches, arenas, don't hit that. Uh, that Safe Drinking Water Act, uh, historic settlements like Halliburton uh, itself, the town of uh, Halliburton, um, is all private uh, uh, private systems. So that's not uh, uh, included. But what it what it does open the door to, which I think is where municipalities were a little bit concerned, is if you include it in Clean Water Act, what's next, right? Is it the municipality taking over those systems and assuming the liability for them? So. Uh, so I think that was a lot of the initial concern around clustered uh, systems and including them or not including them. And in our region, we never we didn't have any clustered systems included by any of our municipalities, which was what 56 or so. Um, and across the province, I don't think there are very many either. There might have been one, maybe um, it's either zero or one. Uh, so, uh, but what it does do is uh, is raise the question. I think uh, you know, is uh, protection of systems is always important. Uh, if there's a, we did have one system that was actually brought online, uh, actually, unless in your your area, which was uh, Letterworth Pines, um, and that was uh, that was <laughs> and that was assumed by the municipality um, uh, through director's order uh, from the province. So, uh, so there there probably are, are other situations kind of similar to that. Um, may not the same uh, may not the same criteria, uh, you know, the uh, uh, contaminant that was of concern there, but uh, but uh, certainly you would see some other. Uh, things like that happen in the future, I think, if there was a, uh, a health uh, issue and the uh, operator was not able to address it uh, through their means, and uh, the municipality tends to be the one that um, is the one that assumes the liability in the end. Uh, so, so it's a it's a pretty yeah complex issue for for sure, um, and that's where the education side comes into play, where Jenna goes out to like you know East Central Farm shows and and uh, Lindsay fairs and uh, different different <laughs> venues like that in order to make sure that uh, there's some education uh, across the board when you're there for you know Clean Water Act purposes you're also there as a you know basically group of water systems in general uh, private or, or municipal uh, so excellent I mean, yeah. oh, please. Sure. 
just how important that is to know. So when you're sitting and working with groups or looking at cluster housing or a you know, tiny home community or whatever, we have to figure out as a municipality where our liabilities will be in the short term and the long term. And so clarity around that would be, you know, helpful just in terms of, I think, general education to municipalities as we're sitting at these housing meetings. Mm -hmm. We could get that out from maybe this department or something. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a fantastic mm -hmm. idea. Absolutely. I think all of us almost, I would assume, are being faced with some variation of that uh, in, as future home development is being proposed. So I, I totally agree. I think it's a great idea to maybe have a... a, a bit of a more depth on on some of that from an educational perspective as we weigh approving some of those that'd be, that'd be great I, I love the idea thank you very much through you chair in my years when anybody offers me a chance to opt in my first question is always is there an option to opt out when you find out that you've got yourself into a situation that leaves so much control to somebody else that you didn't expect or wasn't worded at that point in time is there going to be that kind of flexibility? Uh, there is good question uh, through you, Mr. Chair. There is no opt-out policy that's identified <laughs> the legislation. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. This legislation is Hotel California. Well, it, 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 I always think it's a stupid thing not to ask that when somebody offers you that. It sounds better than it is type of scenario. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Are we? Are we done with this one? Because I, I know Jenna's not. She's got <laughs> a couple other things to do. Um, okay, so if there are no more questions, can I have a mover seconder to reset on the Clean Water Act and source protection? Oh, Jeff. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, Jeff, go ahead. Sorry, I couldn't. I can't see you. <laughs> My apologies. No, no problem. I apologize for not uh, being in there in person. We're just swamped here today and have a community meeting tonight, so I couldn't make it back in time after uh, the board meeting there. Um, <clears throat> I mean, everyone, uh, first off, I'd just like to ask what kind of studies are going in after this new bill has gone in for the More Homes Faster Act here in Durham. So our water, our source water and our wetlands and watersheds are being affected drastically in the coming years. So the ones that will survive from the green belt changes, they're going to be drawn down so much from these new homes uh, and these new capacities that are, are needed on our water systems here. What kind of studies are going to go into how those will survive? You know, we're talking about a million and a half homes coming into this area and drawing water that'll affect an amazing amount of watershed here. So I'm just interested in who's responsible for those studies and are they being done? So through you, Mr. Chair, specifically around the drinking water systems themselves that would be servicing those communities, Durham Region, uh, they're the ones that drive that process that propose those amended, either amendments to uh, existing drinking water systems or a creation of entirely new drinking water systems. So uh, we have worked with Durham Region to complete their requirements under the Clean Water Act, but they're the ones driving that process. Um, if, it's, if they're all being serviced by private wells, unfortunately, those wouldn't be caught under this piece of legislation. Um, and I don't know, Mark, through the CA, do, uh, it, maybe do you want to speak to some of the studies or, or partnerships that we could develop to address those concerns? Yeah, uh, thanks uh, through, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that is a very, uh, very good question. I think um, realistically, there's, there's a number of pieces that are in play there and it, uh, they all tie mostly back to the Planning Act uh, and some of the requirements there. So that is in the setting of official plans and uh, populations that can be served uh, within those areas and those have to be served by infrastructure. So, uh, so if the infrastructure isn't there, I think municipalities would have a, a hard time supporting uh, development. And I've seen a couple of those come through uh, uh, through our municipalities. Uh, and ultimately, it would be uh, the, the uh, municipalities and developers and the criteria that are established to make sure that they can be appropriately serviced. Uh, so that's, uh, I think that is the primary mechanism. Uh, Clean Water Act, uh, 
It, what it would do, as Jenna mentioned, is serve to update the assessment report, um, which is the areas that, uh, in, in the uh, case of a um, groundwater well, for instance, is make sure it has enough capacity uh, to actually service the, uh, the population being uh, proposed. And those are built into the calculations for, uh, uh, for where the drawdown occurs and how often and what's uh, peak capacity for those wells. Um, so those are, are the considerations for, for the Clean Water Act. Uh, at that point, um, as an overarching kind of base, uh, I think that's probably still an outstanding uh, uh, kind of issue. Excellent. Uh, any further questions, Jeff? No, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Follow? Sorry. Don't worry. I'm hurry. <laughs> that's okay. No, I'm not, no hurry. But I, I think I really appreciate what uh, Jeff has raised here to the chair. and. Um, understanding that some of this water is going to be coming possibly from Lake Simcoe, which at one point was a dead lake. And there's some international agreements having to do with the Great Lakes and bringing that water back in. So is that part of what we are dealing with at this committee level? And, and how does that play back in? I really appreciate the fact that Jeff raised that. Um, can you maybe expand? I, I don't even know what question to ask because I have a million questions in my mind about this. Um, and it started back when I was reading the, the stages one, two, three, and four in your slide presentation, thinking that in this question that Jeff raised, we need to go back to number two phase. And is there an opportunity, as I look at this, oh, good, um, that we are considering the physical conditions and land use in that stage two. So what Jeff is raising, would that take us back? Is there a way to reassess stage two with this kind of development and these changes? Yeah. So don't know what question to ask, sorry. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, if any of those existing systems or a new system were to be brought in, they would have to go through each steps one, two, three, and four. Uh, so there's an amendment process. It's defined under section 34 of the Clean Water Act. Those are those municipal driven ones. If the municipality needs to put an additional well into an existing system to get additional capacity or develop an entire new system or look at alternatives such as like you said, Lake Simcoe, um, they would then have to go through that planning process. They would work closely with the source protection committee and myself and the local source protection authority staff uh, to make sure that everything, um, they're meeting all of their requirements under the legislation for all the background studies and all the modeling that has to be done and all of the threats enumerations and verification of how many landowners would be impacted by all of that additional uh, water taking or the changes to the existing system or the development of a new system. They have to go through all of that. Um, and then all of that stuff gets integrated into our existing documents and then comes under that umbrella of all of our existing policies. But they also have to do assessments to make sure that all of our existing policies address what could potentially be on the landscape. If they find that there's some gaps, they could develop new policies uh, and they would work with our local source protection committee to put those policies in place um, or to make sure that the wording of them adequately addresses the threats that are then being brought into this new system that are existing on the landscape already. Um, and through that uh, amendment process, there is extensive engagement, uh, early engagement with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. There's that pre-consultation, again, with all of the affected member municipalities and a prescribed list of impl implementing bodies that then has to go through that public consultation as well. So there's lots of opportunities for input and feedback from not only uh, community members and property owners who would now be impacted, but the municipality themselves. Uh, yourselves as the Source Protection Authority Board of Directors, um, that's, you would have lots of, pardon me, feedback and all of that. Um, but again, those are more municipally driven changes uh, as a result of this development, expanded development. So they would have to go through each of those stages that then um, ends up uh, again under stage four. So then we would be implementing all of the existing policies in that new changed or so new system. Yeah. So through the chair, I just might say my concern too being is that include international agreements? And I know there's a big push for Nevada, Arizona right now. They don't have water. They want to take it to the Great Lakes and take water from our Great Lakes. And so that is, and this is kind of that slippery slope on an international agreement, because if we're allowed to involve the Great Lakes in this development that, um, that was being referred to earlier by Jeff, that's a slippery slope on that international agreement, which would begin to allow them to somehow rationale taking water from the Great Lakes and sending it down to Arizona and Nevada. So I just don't know how we 
work with that. I think there are questions that we never anticipated as we came up with these solutions, but just want to keep it on the record and in the back of our minds. And I suspect Jeff is looking at it closer than any of us. And, and I, yeah, I, I think I, I would just add from, from, from my perspective, I, I think at the end of the day, the, any of the new homes that are coming through the build more homes faster uh, legislation in Bill 23 still have to go through all of the same processes to get approvals. Um, and I think that there still has, correct me if I'm wrong, but there still is that the full process of ensuring that you know where the water is coming from. Is it is it protected? Is there enough water? Things like that. Um, so I don't think the desire to simply hit a number of homes would supersede any of the existing environmental pres uh, uh, preservations that are in place. It, does that is that a fair assessment of, of that? I mean, I don't. In, in in the way I've read the information, it's not like you're going to be able to short circuit any of the re intended re reporting requirements. So I can't just plop housing anywhere. It has to be appropriate yeah. uh, within the legislation. Is that is yeah. that a fair assessment? I'd say that's uh, that's fair according to the rules that are in place at this point in time. Right. Uh, so not, not meaning the cake. <laughs> not, not, not meaning they won't continue to chip away at those, but uh, as it stands right now. Yeah, yeah, and I think there are some. Uh, like, yeah, I think there are some allowances uh, that have been provided in in some of the acts that we've seen. Like the the big one that I can think of is the the big pipe from uh, mm -hmm. Lake Ontario servicing uh, essentially like. Uh, the Lake Huron uh, watershed. Uh, so there was a new act that was uh, put in and I know that there is some accountability, although it doesn't hit our source water piece. Um, it might be more relevant to Lake Simcoe's perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but even there, I think it'd be hard to maybe draw the parallel there other than like more not on the international scale for sure, or even provincials more on the, on this you know, watershed perspective that, uh, that we'd have, more of an, an input on that end. So as a risk management official, looking at development applications as they come through uh, would be you know, the, the aspect that we would look at. But I know internationally, there's accountability as well with the, uh, uh, with the binational agreements and uh, um, in order to make sure that interbasin transfers are minimalized or at least get a sanction through, uh, through that body. So, uh, so there is some accountability there and it's generally frowned upon is my understanding. Uh, but again, I'm not an expert on that, but just from what I've uh, um, been exposed to and read. So. Thank you. Mark. Uh, Jeff, can I ask you a quick question? I just want to make sure that the, 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 the the sort of the underlying theme of what you're asking to make sure that it's being appropriately covered the way the way I interpreted the question that you asked and I want to make sure that maybe we're on the same page but the, the way I, I heard what you were saying is are, are are studies being undertaken to ensure that the natural elements such as wetlands that clean the water uh, that protect the water and and ensure that there is clean water available, those, some of those wetlands and environmental areas are being wiped out, which would potentially mean that the, the natural way in which clean water is simply available is disappearing. And, and are we studying the impact of that? More so than the homes or the use, it was more about the, the loss of the natural environmental uh, uh, the natural environment that helps clean the water system itself is that is that more along the lines of what you're asking more so than 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 just simply draw on it they all funnel into each other right, right. yeah so why water you know it's all connected with the land yeah. so if you if you pave over wetlands if you cut off headwater streams if you damage free flowing rivers like we are doing and we are going to start continue or continue to do in a major way in this area ask municipalities to really have a look at you know what is going on and how it is going to affect each and every one of the wetlands around and your source water protection because you draw so much water especially with these all these new homes coming into our areas. Is it sustainable? You know, I don't believe so. In 10, 20 years, dude, we could be going into a drought issue in some of these areas. 
that'll then affect different wetlands further downstream to die off and different species at risk to be affected. So those all need to come into play. And with the MZOs that Doug Ford's putting out, they're bypassing a lot of these studies to build these homes and build these roads. So to say that the studies are being done, I don't believe they are to the full extent that they could be because they can, they can bypass this, these. They bypass consultation. They bypass a lot of these to, to build these homes. So I just, I just really, I think we need to all pay, you know, have, have an eye open to this. If anyone can recall back in, I believe it was 2010, you know, to, to the, I, I can't see who was speaking there, but uh, uh, with the international rights or, or protection is huge as well, because Georgian Bay lost 80 feet or so, I believe. The water drastically dropped to feed the St. Lawrence waterway, so I was told, for the shipping lanes. Now, I don't, I don't know if that's correct or not, but I do know that they, you know, they had to walk out 80 more feet to get to their boats. And the effect that that has on our fish, our wildlife, you know, everything, it's all intertwined. Water is amazing. It's, it's, so we do have to be very, very careful of this. And it's just the peak of the sword right now. So how we plan today is going to affect us in many, many years. Did that help? Absolutely. Thank you, Jeff. I think that that, that gave a lot more perspective on, on, on what you were, uh, what you were raising. I, I appreciate the, that, that perspective. Absolutely. So I, I wanted to make sure that you had the, that space to make sure that we all heard, uh, uh, you know, a much, uh, deeper, uh, thought process on that. So thank you very much. Thank you much. Any other questions that we have? We already have a mover and seconder. If there's no more questions, I will call the vote to receive the, uh, the presentation. That is passed. Thank you very much. You're not allowed to go anywhere. Nope. So <laughs> let's move directly into the update on the uh, Trent Source Protection Committee activities. All right. So uh, through you, Mr. Chair, this is uh, just a report to summarize the activities of the Source Protection Committee since our last Source Protection Authority Board of Directors meeting. Uh, which was April 21st of 2022. Since that date, there have been four Source Protection Committee meetings, which occurred on May 19th, July 21st, October 4th, and December 16th of 2022. So this is just a brief summary of all of the key discussion topics that were covered at those meetings. So our chair, Jim Hunt, provided updates on the activities that have occurred across the province, including a positive interaction that he had as a one-on-one -on -one meeting with our new director of the uh, Conservation and Source Protection Branch. Her name is Kristen Service. Um, chair, or chief, chief, sorry, chair Hunt's ex um, appointment had actually expired back in August. So uh, at one meeting, we had to appoint an interim chair, which was a successful uh, use of that process. And then after proceeding through the renewal process, Chair Hunt was successful in his bid for reappointment. So again, he is our chair of the Local Source Protection Committee. Our program coordinator, who is out of Lower Trent, he provided a general program update on some of the Section 34 amendments, which are in process. They're both actually within our Kawartha Halliburton Source Protection Area watershed. There was the connection of a new production well in Blackstock, a community that's down in uh, Scugog. And it proceeded through the consultation process with no issues and was submitted to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks for final approval on August 19th. That final approval was issued on December 19th of 2020, uh, sorry, 2022. So water can now be uh, produced and sent to the community, uh, community from that well. There were some preliminary meetings with developers and concerned landowners 
regarding the expansion of the King's Bay drinking water system, which is a system in the city of Kawartha Lakes. And that is triggered by some proposed development in that area. We are anticipating having to go through the formal section 34 amendment process sometime in 2023 for those changes. There is some ongoing program oversight and education and outreach efforts that are being led by Conservation Ontario. They support multiple working groups, including the program managers, there's a transport pathways working group, a communications working group, and one specifically around road salt threats. The groups are creating and sharing valuable education and outreach materials and resources that we are then using uh, and sharing through our ongoing social media campaigns, sharing on our websites and using at our public um, meetings that we're having. There's also training materials that have been de uh, developed by Conservation Ontario, which are using to we as staff are using to uh, help educate real estate agents and municipal councillors. There was a confirmation finally received uh, by our program coordinator that our final budget from the previous fiscal year, which was April 1st of 2021 to March 31st of 2022, it was submitted on time. He also noted that our new transfer payment agreement was received. Everything that we had noted in our budget was request was approved and it spans the next two fiscal years actually. So from April 1st of 2022 to March 31st of 2024, this is actually the first two year transfer payment we have received from the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. There were uh, some best management practices for other systems that were summarized. This uh, is coming from a best management practices document, which was produced by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks to address some of those drinking water systems that aren't currently under the umbrella of the Clean Water Act. So they are ensuring clean water at, or sorry, ensuring clean and safe drinking water to everyone in Ontario for both groundwater and surface water drinking sources. Curve Lake First Nation was actually approved for a pilot project under this best management practices document. So staff from that local source protection area met with staff from Curve Lake First Nation to discuss that. And there was also discussions held with local real estate agents. There are multiple source protection plan amendments that are in the works through that section 36 amendment process that I previously mentioned. Um, they cover off some of the remaining policies that they were identified either through implementation challenges or as a direct result of the changes to the director's technical rules, which is a Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks guidance document. Those policies that were worked on in the last four meetings include the road salt storage policies. So to come into um, alignment with the new director's technical rules, we had to change some of our policy wording as the province now says that much smaller volumes of road salt are considered significant drinking water threats. Those have been reduced down to 10 kilograms. Uh, so now we need to look at managing much smaller volumes of road salt as a significant drinking water threat through either some of those risk management official tools like a risk management plan or prohibition. And uh, the committee had actually come up with what they thought was an innovative approach to prohibiting future storage of some of those volumes of road salt. The uh, program coordinator met with ministry staff. Ministry staff informed them that they wouldn't support this approach. And instead they had opted for a new specify action policy which allows municipalities to set and enforce standards that are related to road salt storage to prevent them from potential exposure to precipitation or runoff. Snow storage is another one of the significant drinking water threats under the Clean Water Act. Uh, so policy wording was amended to allow risk management officials to use municipal zoning maps to determine where commercial or industrial land uses are, as that's what's in the new director's technical rules as where um, some of those significant drinking water threats for snow storage can occur. There was also prescribed instruments that were required, some of those provincial approvals to address snow storage facilities. So policy wording was developed for those. There were questions raised by the committee about why institutional land uses weren't considered for snow storage threats, uh, specifically citing Trent University's parking lots in relation to the Peterborough municipal intake. Uh, so the coordinator clarified that the ministry and the director's technical rules have determined that only commercial or industrial snow storage would result in significant drinking water threats. But then he stated that residential and institutional parking lots can be addressed through that education and outreach tool. Uh, so it could be possible to include some snow storage measures if there was a road salt risk management plan also for the property. So that's maybe how we can address some of those 
that aren't uh, considered under the technical rules. There was technical rule focus on snow plowed into piles on properties that are again with those predominant commercial or industrial land uses and also snow that's relocated and stored at a stormwater drainage system outfall that serve a snow disposal facility. So those ones would be uh, dealt with through a prescribed instrument or an ECA through the ministry. There's new policy wording to address those as well as the stormwater drainage outfall that serves a snow disposal facility. There was some waste policies uh, that required some amendments to be made to them, which were actually removal of some small quantity uh, uh, circumstances. So those that text is no longer significant drinking water threat, therefore no longer needed to be in our policies. Um, that has been removed through the director's technical rules as well. Pesticide application, uh, that's also a significant drinking water threat. And after quite lengthy discussion with local source protection staff and the source protection committee, they felt that they needed to amend the existing policy wording so that it would um, include an exemption from the prohibition when those pesticides need to be used to address human health or environmental threats, such as spraying mosquitoes for West Nile, or some of those noxious or toxic weeds, such as giant hogweed or poison ivy. So when there's a requirement through the health unit to spray for those things, those wouldn't be subject to those prohibition policies. There was wording that had changed some of our prescribed instrument policies, and those are specifically around environmental compliance approvals. Um, so there was concern about some of these approvals uh, that they, they're supposed to contain specific measures related to source water protection and the local source protection plan. So currently the only reassurance the committee had that the ministry was meeting their requirements under the Clean Water Act was the submission of those annual reports. Those annual reports are very general. They didn't go into specific detail. So the policy had written a prescribed instrument policy wording that states that now the ministry has to specifically quote the local source protection protocols and how they're meeting the protection of those local drinking water systems. Uh, that policy is a must conform policy. So the ministry is now required to give us more specific details about how they're meeting our policies. Sewage policies were amended as well. Uh, those ones were changing references to septic systems. All those references had to be changed to uh, on-site sewer works or on-site sewage works as defined within the director's technical rules. There was some updates to the threat subcategories and the circumstances, and they also uh, had to write policies considering the new consolidated linear infrastructure approvals. Uh, the consolidated linear infrastructure permissions are changing current permission frameworks for municipal low risk sewage works or stormwater works, and those are done through environmental compliance approvals. So each municipality is now receiving one consolidated linear infrastructure environmental compliance approval for their municipal sewage selection and a second one for all of their stormwater management stuff. So industrial, commercial and industrial, uh, industrial, commercial and higher risk works will require their own separate environmental compliance approvals. But the new policy wording to address those consolidated linear infrastructures is now built into our policies and that again has to meet the director's technical rules. There was some additional guidance provided around climate change also as a result of the change director's technical rules, which included uh, the ability to include climate change risk assessments when in those source protection reports assessment reports. Uh, and they have also dictated what needs to be included in the risk or in the assessment report should a risk assessment be completed. The wording was added uh, that if an existing climate change policy in the existing climate change policy that directed municipalities to use the uh, Conservation Ontario, there's a tool they've created. It's called the Climate Change Vulnerability Assessment Tool. That's what they've been guided to use should they want to develop a climate action plan and assess climate change impacts on their uh, policy or on their <coughs> water. Uh, there were some also uh, some minor policy amendments, including the removal of some redundant or expired policy wording, correcting terms in the policies. Uh, one example of that is that all First Nations communities wanted to now be referred to as Indigenous communities. The consultation plan was summarized for the committee. Uh, so including the explanatory document, assessment report, and source protection plan package as a whole. Uh, again, those were all done in uh, conformity with the director's technical rules. So the early engagement package was submitted to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation, and Parks to make sure that they were happy with everything that was being proposed. 
Uh, the ministry has approved that and the committee then received an update on how the pre-consultation and public consultation um, processes would occur prior to that final submission by the end of 2023. Also at the committee meeting, every lead, so myself and the four others across our region, provide updates to the committee on the status of any outstanding risk management plans, any current issues or challenges that we are facing, giving status updates on the local uh, amendments to drinking water systems, those municipal or developer driven amendments, and any positive progress or news or successes and challenges that we're experiencing in the, in the program. And those were all received for information by the committee. That's my update. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Question. Thank you, Andrew. No, just a comment. It sounds like that committee is really paying attention and on their toes and, and doing a good job of, of updating um, policy, I guess. Would you agree? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, as staff and through our lead at Lower Trent, um, we really make sure that the committee is informed of any changes that we're notified of by the province, um, such as the changes to the director's technical rules, which had a very, a very wide impact on all of our policies. So we then support them in understanding what those policies are and translating those into updates to our policies in the source protection plan. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Any other questions? Yes, sir. The chair, does that work in reverse? Do you get some chance to feed back up the food chain to give them some instruction and some guidance? Are they listening? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, so that's when we have the opportunity um, through some of those public or pre-consultation and public consultation, even you guys as the board of directors can provide feedback um, on whatever the proposed amendments are. I believe in April, we're going to be showing you um, some of the biggest impacts to the the our guiding documents in the source protection plan so you'll definitely have an opportunity to provide your feedback and comments that they they will then have to consider um, potentially update what they've drafted um, and and yeah so we can also request additional support or clarification from the committee at those meetings as well or through yourselves or through our municipal working group um, there's lots of opportunity to get feedback to them yeah. any other questions Okay, uh, Jeff, we're good. Okay, perfect. Um, can I get a mover and seconder to receive the update on the recent uh, source protection committee? Mover and seconder. Thank you. All right, and can I get a vote, please? Perfect. Last but not least, Jenna. <laughs> Progress. Rear party. <laughs> so, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I mentioned, under the Clean Water Act, we are required to submit annual progress reports by February 1st to our local source protection authority. That's what we're presenting to you now. Uh, and then once you approve it, it will get rolled into a regional report, which Lower Trent as our lead for the Trent Conservation Coalition Source Protection Region will then submit to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks by the May 1st deadline. Uh, the source protection annual progress reports uh, they're a high level summary of all of the implementation activities that have occurred through five uh, implementing bodies or five categories. Um, the format for these annual reports has been guided and dictated by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks through a supplemental report. We've then translated it into a nicer public facing document, which is the one that's in your agenda package, uh, but it, it does all contain the same information. As of 2021, we as a region have transferred away from using messy Excel documents that were a little bit difficult. We had to send out to all of our implementing bodies to having a nice clean online reporting version that everybody can just log into and edit simultaneously. That has worked very well. It's supported by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks and Conservation Ontario. And the hope of the ministry is that it will be adopted across the province. We're one of many source protection regions that use this method and it's been very successful in the last two years of annual reporting. We do hold two training sessions in the end around December and January of the reporting years, just as a refresher and a new training session for municipal staff who are using the reporting tool. We have compiled all of the applicable information into the annual report that's in your agenda package, but I'll just give you a, a high level summary of what's contained within it. And once the board has approved this report, uh, it will be um, approved by the Source Protection Committee. It's actually next Thursday, March 30th. So in anticipation of your approval of our grading, 
uh, draft of our report has been contained within the lower Trent, uh, the Trent Conservation Coalition as Source Protection Committee annual report. And that's that one that has to be approved by uh, May 30 or May 1st. You will be seeing our regional report at our report in April, or our um, meeting in April, sorry. So just a quick summary of the annual progress report grading. There are, uh, as I mentioned, five sections. Those sections are municipal progress, septic inspections, those risk management plans, all the provincial reporting progress and changes in awareness and behavior. And they are assigned one of three grades. There is progressing well or on target, satisfactory or limited progress made. So overall, our source protection authority will get one grade and it will be based on um, all of those five inputs. So the municipal progress reporting, the, all of our municipalities, the planning authorities are responsible for 56 policies within the Trent Source Protection Plan. We have all of our member municipalities established standard operating procedures for the day-to-day -day screening of those applications. Four of them have completed all of their official plan and zoning bylaw amendments, and the remaining ones are in progress with anticipated approvals shortly. All of our municipalities have completed uh, their annual or their amendments to their processes, and um, all of the municipalities have also completed their emergency management plans. So our suggested grading for the municipal section is progressing well and on target. Our septic inspections are completed under the Ontario Building Code for all of the existing septic threats on the land. That's a mandatory septic inspection that occurs on a five-year basis. And it's for all of the properties that have septics in those drinking water protection zones, those vulnerable areas. Those septic inspections are most often completed by the building inspectors or the chief building officials. However, in Durham region, they're completed by Durham Health. Uh, so of the existing septic threats, there's 364 of them that were completed in the first five-year phase. All of them were inspected. 301 of them, or 83%, had passed with no concerns or no maintenance required. 51 or 14% had passed with minor maintenance required, such as pumping or replacement of a lid. And 12% uh, or sorry, 12 or 3% had failed and required major work such as replacement. We are now in the second five year inspection timeframe. And of the existing 365 septics that require inspection, 189 have been inspected to date in this timeframe. 16 of which required minor maintenance and seven of which required major maintenance. So again, we have proposed a grading of progressing well and on target for our septic inspections. For the risk management of plans that are carried out by the risk management officials, we are responsible for 39 policies within the source protection plan to manage threats through those tools that I've mentioned previously, either prohibitions, risk management plans, or restricted land uses. Due to the pandemic and lockdowns, as well as unexpected staffing changes in some of our member municipalities, we as a region had struggled to complete all of our risk management plans within that time year, five year time frame. As such, we, were received, we received an extension of two years by the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, which resulted in us having to uh, have all of our risk management plans completed by December 31st of 2022. Within the 2022 calendar year, there were six risk management plans that had been negotiated, bringing in our watershed that have brought the total up to 47 risk management plans with people engaged in activities on the landscape. Those collectively manage 662 or 98 percent of all of the significant drinking water threats, uh, of which there are 376 or 673. Excuse me. Uh, all of the inspections were carried out on risk management plans that were already in place. Um, for 2022, that, those numbers are nine uh, inspections that were completed. We are now inspecting all of the in, in, existing risk management plans on the same schedule once a year. Uh, with, and all of those inspections have resulted in a 100% compliance rate. So everybody who has a risk management plan is doing everything that's within the risk management plan that we require them to. Uh, as a result of some of these inspections, we have found that some risk management plans need to be revoked or amended due to changes in property ownership or changes or cessation of the activity on the land. Risk management officials within the, our watershed, the Kawartha Halliburton Source Protection Watershed, have issued 23 of those restricted land use notices in 2022, resulting in a total of 149 Section 59 notices 
since the effective date of the source protection plan being January 1st of 2015. Processes to screen development applications have been working well and municipalities continue to fine tune those processes when necessary. For the risk management plan implementation, we have suggested a grading of progressing well and on target. Our five uh, provincial ministries that are listed as implementing bodies in the source protection plan are responsible for 27 policies in the plan. And are, we've received information that they have implemented 70% of those. However, the other 30% are listed as continuing or ongoing and will most likely always be marked as in progress and never completed. In your report, you'll see a table that summarizes that, but quickly, OMAFRA, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, has completed all of their policies and implemented them all. The Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks has implemented 90% and the other 10% are in progress. The Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry has implemented 100% of their policies. The Ministry of Transportation has implemented 60% and the other 40% remain in progress. And the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing has 100% of their policies as still in progress, resulting in a uh, suggested grade of progressing well and on target. The final section that we discuss is the source protection awareness and changes in behavior. Uh, so road signage is a big part of that. We have identified that as a very effective tool for making people aware of the program and the importance of protecting their drinking water sources. Prior to 2022, there have been 60, 60 drinking water protection zone road signs that have been installed within our watershed, four of which have been on provincial highways and the other 56 are on municipal or county roads. We've also been able to start attending in-person meetings, as Mark had said. I've been to the East Central Farm Show and the Country Living Show, where we have education and outreach materials available for everybody, including private landowners, on those best management practices that they can undertake on their property to protect their own and their community drinking water. We have vulnerable area maps, and we actually have an example road sign that are a big draw for people to come into our booth. Everybody has questions about them and likes to find where they live on the maps. Uh, the Coortha Lakes, myself, risk management official, I hosted a meeting with the Technical Standards and Safety Association, along with the Ontario Petroleum Transporters and Technicians Association, the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks, the Ministry of Government and Consumer Services, and local fuel providers to create a partnership and launch a pilot program, which would have uh, ensure, help us ensure that all those private fuel outlets in source protection areas are being regularly inspected by those uh, technical uh, petroleum or the petroleum transporters and technicians association. Uh, so that was a very successful meeting and uh, it was actually the pilot for all the meetings that are happening across the province now. And myself from Kawartha Conservation in association with a couple of my planning and permitting colleagues with the, in partnership with the city of Kawartha Lakes, we hosted an information session for real estate agents and builders uh, we've covered topics such as the source water protection program and its requirements, the planning requirements, permitting requirements, information on septic systems and various other municipal programs and incentives. The session was very well attended and our local real estate board has asked that we make it a yearly event. So we usually do that around November of each year now. Uh, and then we also continue to share uh, multiple Conservation Ontario resources and information uh, on our website and social media. So for changes in behavior and awareness, we've suggested a grade of progressing well and on target. Uh, overall, all of our annual reports were received by all of our implementing bodies and have been summarized, resulting in a grade of progressing well and on target for all of them. So overall, we suggest that uh, the board approve our suggested status of progressing well and on target for the Kawartha Halliburton Source Protection Authority for uh, the implementation of all of our policies for our annual report. Fantastic. Thank you for all of the amazing information today. Does anybody have any questions on the annual progress reporting? Yes, sir. Through the chair, the housing authority, they got 100% of their stuff and it's still in motion. Is there kind of an overriding theme there or a problem or? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's some of those ones that are um, some of that ongoing, like the policy wording states that it's ongoing efforts. So they don't feel that they want to say that they are completely implemented if it's some, a program like education and outreach or continual consultation on some of these developments. They don't want to say that they fully implemented that because they're always doing it. They're always going to be doing it. 
Um, but that's, again, uh, as we discussed earlier, the ministry is a little bit vague on the information that they give back to us. Uh, but that's that was how it's been explained to me is that it's always going to be an ongoing uh, thing. So therefore, they don't want to say that it's been fully implemented. And I think the idea is the work is truly never done because yeah. there's always development, right? So, any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Just a clarification, if I may, and that is the uh, 365 inspections, septic inspections. Does that include Halliburton area too? So it's all in yes. most public. Through you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So every septic system that's in, so the vulnerable areas for Lutterworth Pines and Minden. Uh, and then there's a couple that are in Ken Mount that fall within Halliburton County as well. Yes, they were all done in that first five year time frame. Um, and then they will be completed. I think I've been told by the staff up in Minden that they're going to do them this spring for uh for this five year time frame. So yes, they do include um all the septic inspections from Durham Region, City of Corth Lakes, and Halliburton County. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. Any other questions? Okay, no questions. I'm gonna. The motion is a bit long, so I'll read it out. Uh, resolve that the uh, Kawartha Halliburton Source Protection Authority approve the grade of P progressing well on target for the status of implementation within the watershed, and that the draft Kawartha Halliburton Source Protection Authority annual progress report be endorsed and forwarded to the Source Protection Committee for comment in accordance with uh, zero. Uh, o dot reg two eight seven slash zero seven. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you. And a vote. That is passed. Thank you very much. And now you get to you get to sit. <laughs> and again, thank you very much for all the great information today. All right, let's move on to number eight. Mark. Yep, great. Uh, so this actually uh, is a topic that relates to some of the uh, information that Jenna uh, translated to us uh, in terms of uh, some of the SPA responsibilities uh, in appointing source protection members for our watershed area. So, uh, so this uh, also uh, refers back to Director Burns' uh, uh, question about longevity of members and how that plays in. So there were municipal elections, as you all know, uh, in the last, uh, last year, and that resulted and one of our members uh, from Halliburton uh, uh, moving on from uh, municipal uh, politics. So, uh, so there was a need. And the way that we structure it is, uh, is that we have two members, uh, two source protection uh, uh, authority uh, appointed members that go to the source protection committee. And, uh, and that's based on the additional geography that we pull in. So we have 2,500 square kilometers in the south and 3,000 square kilometers in the north. Uh, so it seemed to make a lot of sense to make sure that the north and south were appropriately uh, represented by uh, by that respective uh, kind of grouping of, of municipalities. Uh, so we did uh, put out the call for uh, for a nomination for uh, members to our municipalities. Uh, it was originally two members that we were looking at. Uh, we did have nominations for, for both, but uh, one of them didn't meet the qualification criteria. Um, so, uh, so we had to uh, um, uh, remove that person from, uh, from that appointment process. So Halliburton uh, remained. Uh, and, uh, and so Councillor, uh, the Deputy Mayor uh, Cecil Ryle was, uh, was selected from the Halbert municipalities to, uh, to represent the Source Protection Committee. Uh, and uh, the nomination process is the first part of that process. And then once uh, there's nominations received, then it goes back out to all of the municipalities within the Source Protection uh, uh, Authority area to make sure that uh, they are in concert and want that member to represent them. Uh, on the committee because they do represent the interests not only of that municipality but the broader collective. So, uh, so that's the uh, kind of uh, reason why uh, council resolutions are required across uh, across all of the um, municipalities. So, uh, at this point in time, you see the resolution is a uh, is a lengthy one. Uh, so, it's just recognizing the nomination and uh, looking for endorsement for uh, for the Highlands East uh, Deputy Mayor Cecil Ryle. As uh, as municipal uh, representative, and uh, and then there's a couple caveats that we've included uh, since we haven't received all of the municipal resolutions uh, at this point in time. So once we do receive them all, then uh, we'll forward that member on to uh, to the lead CA for official appointment onto the committee. So uh, that's the uh, the background on that particular file. We've received about fifty percent of the council resolutions, two of them today. Uh, so they are in, uh, in progress. And, uh, and then just as a, a bit of a highlight as well, uh, I do understand that the City of Corth Lakes members, and they have the most of the systems actually in the entire 
Trend Conservation Coalition, uh, they usually get the, the second member uh, as well. And so they are interested, it appears, to uh, reappoint a member. But at this point in time, the mayor is serving on that committee, but uh, but looking for a replacement. Uh, so, so that's the, the status of this point. So if your municipalities get another letter saying, hey, we've got another nomination uh, looking for support, uh, that's, uh, that's why you'll, you'll get that. So I uh, require a little bit of an extra, uh, extra step in terms of resolutions, but uh, we'll get there at the end. Fantastic. Thank you. Any questions, Mark, about this process? Okay, seeing none. Oh, you did so. You're not, <laughs> not joking. I'm going to push my hooked on phonics uh, uh, teaching. Uh, okay, we resolved that the Township of Highlands East Deputy Mayor uh, Cecil Ryle uh, be endorsed as the municipal representative on the Trent Conservation Co uh, Coalition Source Protection Committee, and that the this endorsement be uh, active upon receipt of all formal council resolutions from each of the member municipalities within the Kawartha Halliburton Source Protection Area. And that upon uh, active uh, endorsement, that the municipal representative for the Kawartha uh, Halliburton Source Protection Area be forwarded to the Lower Trent Source Protection Authority as the lead source protection authority for official appointment to the Source Protection Committee. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. <laughs> Can I get a seconder? Thank you. All right, and a vote on that, please. And that is carried unanimously. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, correspondence. Yep. Do you want to address that? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the correspondence uh, which you see before you is uh, is really dominated by the appointments to uh, to the board uh, from uh, from our Halberton uh, friends, our Halberton municipalities. Uh, so you see those, and uh, and then there is uh, a correspondence from uh, from the uh, Minister of Conservation and Parks. Uh, just uh, approval of the proposed amendments uh, to the assessment report. It was a long process uh, in terms of updating the assessment report, and that was related to Blackstock Well and putting a well online. Uh, so there was a, I say it was a pretty simple operation, but uh, but required a fair bit of effort to, to get there in the end. So that was uh, that was approved. And, uh, and then the other nominations that you have there are related to the Source Protection Committee and, uh, and resolutions to support, uh, uh, as we were just talking about. So uh, in the next update, uh, the next Source Protection Committee uh, meeting, or sorry, Source Protection Authority meeting, we'll have the other council resolutions uh, as they come in. Perfect. Any question on the attached correspondence? Oh, all right, if I can get a mover and seconder to receive the correspondence attached to the, the uh, presentation today. Thank you. Thank you. And a vote, please. Perfect, that is carried. Okay, uh, new business. Did anybody have new business uh, to address during the meeting? Okay, seeing none. Uh, just to, to ensure everybody is aware, our next meeting is on April 20th, 2023. If you don't have it in your calendar or have accepted the um, meeting, please uh, let us know if you'll be here to ensure that we'll have quorum. And with that, I will accept a mover and a seconder for adjournment. Thank you. Thank you. And a vote on that, please. That is passed. Thank you, everybody. I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> These ones are always work. in March. They're always good. Thank you much, everyone. Have a great day. It should be, yeah. Jeff, are you sticking around for the next meeting? <laughs> Sorry? Are you sticking around for the next meeting? Oh, yep. Yeah, it's going again. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably a bit of a mushroom break. Then. Yeah, everybody, if you want to take a, a few minutes before we get started in our next meeting. Um, Do we have a quorum? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
started, I would just like to go through the land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships, both historic and modern, with the territories upon which we are located. Today, this area is home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We acknowledge that our watershed forms a part of the treaty and traditional territory of the southeastern Anishinaabe. Uh, it is on these ancestral and treaty lands that we live and work. To honor this legacy, we commit to being stewards of the natural environment and undertake to have a relationship of respect with our treaty partners. And again, if we can have a brief moment of silence to consider that. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, so before we get started, um, I'm just going to uh, talk briefly. Obviously, we've gone over time. Um, so I'd like to do confirm two things before we get started. Is everybody okay extending to 430 today? Does anybody have a hard stop? Or can we get to 430 today? Are we all good with 430? Uh, an extension to 430? Yes, I thought I was supposed to be there. That anyways. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, and with that, I also have a few uh, changes to the agenda. So, uh, what we'd like to do to, to stay on as uh, as close to time as possible, we are going to be moving uh, the presentation on the hearing uh, procedures six point one. Um, <clears throat> the staff report on Bill 23, 7.4, uh, and the closed session, we'll be moving that to our next meeting. All right, so those three items will be moved to the next meeting. Um, if we're all okay with that, can I get a mover and seconder for that move? Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. And can I get a vote on that, please? Perfect. So we have both the change in the adoption of the agenda. Uh, declaration of pecuniary interest in the nature thereof. Seeing none. Fantastic. Has everybody had a chance to take a look at the minutes from last time? Um, any changes, additions, omissions that they noticed in the board minutes? All right. Can I get a mover and seconder to uh, adopt minutes? Okay. Thank you, sir. And a seconder. Thank you. And a vote, please. Fantastic. We're moving along. Uh, any business arising from the minutes that we needed to discuss? Seeing none. Okay. And no deputations. Um, and with that, we'll move into the presentations. Uh, as we all agreed, we'll be moving uh, 6.1 to next time. But Matt, was that the only thing you were here for? Like, no? <laughs> you got dressed up. You're sitting here all this time. You're like, oh, come on. <laughs> no, I get up <laughs> So we will, you know, anticipate it next time. Well, but with that, we're going to move on to 6.2, which is the Lake Skugog Enhancement Project. Um, and uh, Nancy and Tanner, right, are going through that? <laughs> Put you both in the line of fire. Tanner, you know, I've never seen you in person. You've always been on the phone every time we, we I talk to you. So yeah. pleasure to see you in person. <laughs> so as they're getting set up, I'd just like to introduce this is Tanner Lang. He's our water quality specialist. And he's going to present to you today on the Lake Skugog Enhancement Project. This project intends to improve water quality coming from urban areas and going into Lake Skugog. Today, his presentation will run through highlights of the current stage of the project. Thank you. Just yeah. right. Through you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, everybody. As Nancy said, my name is Tanner. I'm the one point specialist here. And I'll be talking about Lake Skugog Enhanced Project. Um, hope you guys have been having a good day today. I uh, promise to make this uh, quick so you guys are on time. So further ado, uh, just a bit of background. Lake Skugog is an artificially shallow productive lake. Um, part of uh, Lake Skugog is Port Perry Bay and through kind of just um, development through uh, in Port Perry, like many historical towns, they didn't really think about stormwater management. But over the years, stormwater has exited the town and into Port Perry Bay um, because of its natural shallowness. I believe it's less than 1.3 meters, so four and a half feet. 
I'm five foot seven, so <laughs> around here. Um, that excess nutrient rich stormwater and contaminants uh, have left Port Perry Bay in a state that uh, is not really liked upon. There's lots of uh, aquatic vegetation or invasive species such as corn and Eurasian milfoil and other uh, contaminants as well due to excess input of stormwater. So like Nancy said, the purpose of the Lake Seagog Enhancement Project is to improve the recreational and function of Port Perry Bay, while also creating a healthy wetland habitat and providing water quality benefits. Some key project components is the dredging of key recreational areas, reusing that uh, dredge aid for the beneficial reuse of the creation of a wetland uh, and establishing a berm that holds the wetland back, the, the installation of oil grit separators uh, and do I have a laser? Here we go. So, sorry, dredge area, wetland, berm. Um, number four, the aquatic vegetation management plan is just using a harvester. This has been ongoing Township of Scugog effort. And fifth is the fisheries authorization because we are um, kind of destroying existing fish habitat. We have uh, under the fisheries act, we have to offset that. Could, could you just um, geographically um, help me understand where the, let's say for instance, where the library is in this diagram? The library is up here. So further up there, and then the, the, dock, the dock that and the harbor, that's the harbor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is uh, Boss Independent, right. where I get my groceries. <laughs> uh, and this is Joe Farrell Park right here, uh, the first Hazel Diamond tennis court. That's the parking lot. That's what and that's Palmer Park. Yeah. And then just off screen is the old mill. Yeah. And uh, and Latchum's up. And I, I can't see it from here, but that green area that with the lines, that's. That is the aquatic vegetation management plan. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Um, so our responsibility as Forest Conservation is to be the technical lead. This project is owned and uh, is owned by the Township of Scugog, and we have an additional partner, Scugog Lake Stewards, who lead the fundraising aspect for this project. Uh, in addition, we have the Healthy Lake Scugog Steering Committee, uh, which is the advisor for the group. This is a Township of Scugog committee that has uh, representatives from all levels of government. Um, even uh, local members of the public, as well as business owners. Um, so they kind of advise us on, on this project. So the footprint of the Lake Scugog Enhancement Project, this is uh, a shot of last year, I believe, of Port Perry Bay, so um, from previous. So this is kind of like uh, facing northwards. If we take a look here, uh, north is down here and that's south, that's the independent. Those are two baseball diamonds. So you can see there is an abundance of uh, aquatic macrophytes. Uh, to our right here, this is the area to be dredged to 1.8 meters. Uh, and this is the area that will be used for the wetland. The three triangles here are known stormwater outlets uh, from uh, the urban areas. So this wetland will provide additional uh, water, uh, stormwater treatment. We are proposing to put the oil and grit separators at these two locations, but these oil and grit separators only address suspended sediment and oil. Anything dissolved or any other contaminants that the oil and grit separate does not do it quite well, but the wetland does because we're using its uh, ecological services. Um, between Talking about ecological services between the lake, like the inner lake of Lake Scugog, and the wetland, the wetlands of Lake Scugog provide three times the amount of ecosystem services than the, the inner lake. So, has this done before? Urban wetlands recently have become this new trend. Um, we see it across the country. We have Ralph in Calgary, Alberta. This is a man made wetland. We have Coots Paradise, which has ongoing wetland restoration project adjacent to Hamilton. We have Mimico, Waterfront Park in Etobicoke, and Sackville Park in Sack Sackville, New Brunswick. Um, so these are urban wetlands that have been built 
uh, humans. Um, these aren't uh, natural. Uh, some of it's natural, uh, but uh, there's a lot of investment in the ecosystem services that wetlands do provide. One I want to bring up is the Toronto Portlands. This is as urban as you can get in Canada, downtown Toronto. Uh, CN Tower is right there, Rogers Center, or the Sky Dome, as people refer to. Um, this is at the outlet of the Don River. Um, so the point of this project is to address flooding naturalization and to create a space where people can gather, a unique space in the downtown core that people can gather to uh, connect to each other, but also to the environment. On the picture to the right here, these are anything in green are marsh-like ecosystems that they are planning to restore. And you can see that on this slide here, a lot of recreational benefits come from these marshlands. And in the study by Urban Metrics, they found that, you know, Toronto has invested a lot of money in the revitalization of their waterfront. And this has generated almost uh, three times the amount of money uh, coming, pumping in back into the economy. So going back to the Lake Skugog Enhancement Project, the, the Lake Skugog Enhanced Project was thought of based on two man, man, management plans, Lake Skugog Environmental Management Plan and the Port Perry Stormwater Management Plan. Um, the recommendation coming out of this report was dredging in uh, recreational and economic significant areas. And the recommendation coming out of the Port Perry Stormwater Management Plan, uh, recommendation number one was the installation of oil grit separators at Casp near Street, which is, I will go back, Right here. So why Port Perry Bay? So here, the orange triangle is where the proposed wetland is. And as you can see, much of the downtown core is untreated for stormwater. And we can see that in the data in the Lake Skugog Environmental Management Plan, where the area that we sampled in the lake, just next to Port Perry, has consistent and higher elevations of total phosphorus. And that makes up about 18.2% of all phosphorus entering the lake from urban runoff. So some key issues, Port Perry Bay, the reduced in water depth, accumulation of sediment and organic matter, excessive amount of non-native aquatic plants, and this has impacted the water quality of Port Perry Bay, the shoreline, habitat and fisheries, and the overall look of Port Perry Bay, which has been impacted term tourist based activity. So through the environmental assessment that we are currently going through, we have a bunch of options that we have proposed to the public as well. Alternative one, do nothing. That's not so good, doesn't address this stormwater input and ex excess sediment in the bay. What if we dredge the material and hoff offsite? This is, has a high cost in transportation and disposal, and it does not have any environmental benefits. Option three, what about we dredge all material and haul it uh, to, cause, to make a wetland adjacent to the causeway, which is Highway 7. Uh, adjacent to Highway 7 is a provincially significant wetland the impacts environmentally would be too high and the permit to get that would be uh, basically MRR said no. Option number four, what if we dredge a smaller area and use it for a smaller wetland? So this has limited effect to mitigate stormwater input and uh, limited improvement to recreational usage. Option number five was to dredge and to create an, an island offshore. This was, uh, there was a lot unknown with the stabilization of the island because the dredge was full of organics. We wouldn't know how um, stabilized it would be and it would be a hazard for boat boating as well. So we picked number seven, but I'll go to number, uh, we picked number six, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna go to number seven. So the use of benthic mats, just a, a, a coca choir mat on the bottom of the lake that has some, um, disposal fee because it's organic and might uh, degrade and you would have to replace it. 
Uh, it's not really addressing stormwater and ha it has limited recreational benefits. And there would be an ongoing cost to replace that benthic mat or year over year. Numbers. So the estimated cost. So this is the estimate cost for the project um, in June 2022. It's about $5 million. Uh, and the cost will be updated once we progress to detail design. Right now, we're at the preliminary design phase. Um, so that number is expected to change once we have the detailed design in. So the current funding, so right now we have $4.1 million raised. Um, a large portion of it comes from the Mississauga of Scugog Island First Nation, as well as Durham region. Uh, we have some smaller grants from the Greenbelt Environment Canada and the Scugog Lake Stewards, they had it. Uh, started their public fundraising uh, campaign yet. So that's why that number is, is quite low. And so far, uh, the Township of has put in 20% uh, um, into this project. We have put in some applications to uh, the province as well as Infrastructure Canada. We are awaiting uh, results from that. Currently, we so through the municipal class EA, uh, we have a preliminary design. We have done some background studies. Uh, right now we're in the public commenting period, the 30 day commenting period, as well as another 30 day for the ministry to review it. Uh, this is the proposed timeline um, where once we have all the uh, comments from the public, we would move toward uh, final design where we would look at, for example, the type of material for the path, how the bridge will look, what kind of plants to put in. Again, we would go to uh, the council at uh, Township Scugog for their input and their possibly um, a decision. Um, if so, um, everybody's in agreement, then we would move toward tendering contracting uh, as well as uh, a possible uh, uh, construction start in the fall. Um, but, you know, after the final design, we have federal permits as well, and they will fall in line as long as, uh, you know, everything goes well around uh, the final design and the uh, input from the council. Hope you enjoy that. Any questions? It will be. So you chose number six, which was to move most of it to decide to create the wetland. That's right. So, so can, you, can you please explain what, where is the bridge going from where to where? Yeah. Oh, sorry. You can't really see it. So, the, so this is the berm. So there is a bridge here. So see this main channel? Yeah. It will go right here. It will connect both sides of the berm right here. Um, and, and in the package, there is an artist rendition of that, yeah. that bridge. So that artist's rendition isn't the full detailed design of the bridge yet. That's just a placeholder. Uh, we will uh, be working on the detailed design of it. We have a great bridge designed by Bill Lishman in one of the work mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a smaller bridge, right? Thank you. Any other questions? I agree with you with, um an update of the situation where it is there now. I was looking at it this morning. The as far as the oil grit separators, the one at the Casimir Street um, outlet mm -hmm. is in place. The lid was on it this morning when we oh, Yeah, nice. Yeah. So it, it, that's coming along. Um <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm we, we have approved, as you know, it's their DEA assessment as yeah. that's what council approved. And yeah, okay, there's the uh, there we go. So yeah. There's the, uh, so, yeah, the oil grit separator, like you said, at Casimir has been completed. <laughs> Yeah, that top floor was just yesterday. They just did that yesterday. Yeah, put that in. And the, uh, so. Now that oil grit separated, it won't take any suspended um, um, salts or, or anything, any nitrates or phosphates. So that, that center core, is that, that's fiber, is it? So um, it will address suspended solomon. It's just the dissolved piece. So, uh, you know, if you take a glass of water, you dissolve the salt. Um, it doesn't really capture it because 
Honestly, sorry, I just, um, <laughs> the old grid separator is a septic tank essentially. So um, for stormwater, and that's just a uh, filter membrane. So the water, sorry, it enters through, there's a pipe here. It goes in, into a chamber below, right? And then it, um, the chamber below dissipates the, the, the inflow and it settles out the suspended solderment. And then underneath here, there's a, there's a kind of like a cap where the oil will rise and it won't be captured in the water coming out here. Um, this thing I have seen, you can um, add uh, like a phosphorus absorbing material to uptake kind of the different forms of phosphorus, but um, at the current stage, um, it's designed to address the suspended solids. And another question if I could, Mr. Chair, to go through. Sorry, sir. Um, um, what is the capacity of these things? Like, wait, we're presented with an idea that they would need to be serviced, cleaned out once a year. Mm -hmm. Like, how much, how many cubic yards or feet would that uh, separator hold? And do you think that once a year of clean out is, is um, expected or would that be in mind? So the general maintenance of this is, it's hard to, uh, so to answer one of your questions, how much is this addressing? Uh, there, it, it is designed to accommodate a certain catchment area. Um, I have to take a look at the specs, but it is designed to have at least 70% 70, 70 removal efficiency. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of maintenance, it, it depends on, um, you know, has it been, uh, a crazy year where there's a lot of soil um, kind of on the street, a lot of precipitation going in. But so it really depends on what that year is. I can't really answer to be specific, but it goes to show the monitoring aspect of this is key. And if you think about whatever is being stuck in here, isn't going into the lake. <clears throat> Uh, through Mr. Chair, usually what happens uh, just to facilitate uh, kind of facility management or infrastructure management is uh, is there's a contract that's done in combining with the catch basins and cleaning those out with oil grid separators. So they tend to be harmonized together and the trucks are usually pretty busy as well because uh, they service all the municipalities all the way around. Uh, so uh, my understanding is, uh, I think it's the either the fall or the spring that the township gets it and i think it's the fall that they usually are, are able to get to their uh, their catch basin clean outs but if you don't clean it out every year the efficiency drops off essentially it's packed full of sediment and the water just you know kind of rips through as a result so uh when it gets uh, full then the efficiency will drop correspondingly so kind of like a septic tank yeah. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions on the project Okay, thank you very much, Jenna. Um, we just want to do a quick, can I get a mover and seconder to uh, receive the presentation from Jenna? Thank you, and a vote please. That passes, thank you very much. Um, and now we're gonna move on to, um, uh, who's leading the, the next one, the 6.21? Yeah, uh, I think, uh, well, um, See, I think we have down Nancy and Tanner for that. Okay. Maybe what I can do is I can give an introduction anyway. Okay, sure. On That's that, great. It, yeah. it does hit several different aspects of, uh, right. of uh, uh, people. And I know John's uh, support for this as well. And uh, so the second report that we have here uh, just provides a, a little bit of uh, background for the Lake Scoop Bug uh, Enhancement Project and uh, provides some details. And what we're looking for, uh, as, you, as you see in the resolution, is uh, we have a grant. Uh, that we have uh, been successful in. So um, because a lot of, uh, and the background on that too, is that we're in year two of that grant, uh, which was the big year for, uh, for that grant. Um, the deadline is fast approaching on that. So March uh, 31st is uh, the end of the uh, federal and provincial fiscal years. And this is a federal grant, I believe. 
that we received. So, uh, so that year is ending, and because all the work's kind of getting crammed into the, as you saw, the uh, oil grid separator is uh, it's just coming into play. Uh, the funding is to implement the uh, the oil grid separator and get some uh, some of the design uh, criteria worked out. So, uh, that's all coming to a head basically in the last uh, couple of weeks of, of the year um, and then moving out into April as we get invoices. So uh, what we were concerned about was our financial flow of information and that being above some of our purchasing policy guidelines. So uh, what we're looking for is, uh, is just an endorsement from the board to, uh, to be able to move through that process and be able to process those grant dollars. So uh, old grid separators, I think, uh, you know, fairly large numbers that have checked the report again for that, but it's, uh, you know, upwards of $150,000, $160,000 to do that. Um, sorry? I think they're around two hundred fifty. dollars Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, there's big numbers in behind it, right? So, uh, and uh, you can just check that because we have it all listed out in terms of the, uh, the numbers. So, um, Sorry? It was 202 for two, yeah, 202 for the oil grid separator there. So uh so that's uh you know over and above the fifty thousand dollars that I have uh as identified in my in the purchasing policies. So uh just looking for board uh board approval. What we would do is uh I uh, use the township of Scugog procurement process uh to uh, to be able to verify for our audit purposes um the uh uh the good uh, kind of use of funds uh, from that side of things. So uh, so that is the surrogate that we're using on that end. And uh, and you see the expenses kind of listed out to 350. So uh, like I say, we were worried about uh, everything coming in one shot. So this is kind of geared towards uh, making sure that we're able to do that and, and also address uh, if we had to any special considerations for our bank. Uh, as well, we're, we have $150,000 a day limit. Uh, our bills go out every um, every uh, two weeks. And so it would be part of that process, uh, which means that uh, we'd have to add that on top of our bills. So that was uh, the uh, third part of the uh, resolution was just making those arrangements with the uh, banking institution to make sure that we can process the funds uh, uh, without overdrafting our, our, our limits and, and doing that. So, uh, so that's a... a pretty brief summary of, uh, of the report. Uh, uh, and if you want any more uh, detail on that, uh, yeah, certainly we'll need to answer any questions. Did we want to cover anything else in, in the report attached? Or um, is that, I mean, those are the highlights. Yeah, I think uh, I think those are the highlights. And, uh, and with Tanner's uh, presentation, um, I think you have a, a sense of uh, some of the uh, information that goes into it. And this was just putting in the, in the you know, a, a report format more than a presentation. Absolutely. Are there any questions about uh, about the this item on the agenda? All right. We all understand what we're going to be approving. No questions around that. All right, it's a bit of a long resolution. Let me take a look at that. And it resolved that the Lake Skugog Enhancement Project update be received, and that the board approve uh, the transfer of funds related to year two expenditures associated with the Environmental and Climate Change Canada funding grant with an upset uh, upset limit of 350000 as per our purchasing policy to the Township of Skugog in accordance with the eligibility expenses provided for by the funding grant, and that the other necessary adjustments to facilitate the financial transaction with our banking institution be made. So if I can get a mover and seconder, thank you very much. Seconder, thank you. And a vote, please. That is carried. Thank you very much. Harold, did you want the check made up personally to yourself? And you'll take care of that for everyone? Okay, good. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. DG transfer award. Thanks. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the staff report 7.1. You want to take us through the permits issued by designated staff? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as done on page 25 of the agenda, a summary of issued permits by designated staff for first conservation issued a total of 36 permits were issued. We are seeking resolution of the section 28 permits issued by staff as being received. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, how many by undesignated staff? First. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anything else that you wanted to add on that? Anybody have any questions on that extensive presentation? No? 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, Through you, Mr. Mr. Chair, I just like to highlight uh, some of uh, Matt and his team's uh, work on the uh, permits. Uh, as you noted in the previous report, uh, uh, we weren't quite hitting the the benchmarks that we were wanting to. So you can see that we've uh, uh, we've they've uh, been uh, working hard to make sure that uh, we're meeting those timeframes. And uh, and so you see that there is uh, some pretty uh, significant improvement mm -hmm. on that end. And, and we'll look to improving that further as uh, as we uh, uh, move through the applications and, uh, and process things. So perfect. And, and to that point, Matt, uh, is it just been having people back in place that has been able to ramp that up? Or have you uh, been able to implement any other efficiencies in the process? Um, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, uh, we've been, it's a bit of both. It's getting staff mm -hmm. back on board, it's training, it's mm -hmm. it's uh, also, we did shift our strategies a bit where we signed the, the newest member to work on the streamlined, easier ones to get experience with it because she's only been here since January. Right. So she's been learning the process with the easier ones and getting harder and harder and working backwards to where mass small ones, like the old ones, should get them all cut up. Perfect. Thank you very much. Any other questions on this? Okay, can I get a mover and a seconder? Um, for, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, I'm just one quick question here just for my education here since I'm new. Um, the days over on these permits on the, from the, uh, when steam complete until, it varies wildly from not being over till two to three months over. Uh, just, just quickly, what is the, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, um, what is the biggest uh, factor that uh, determines why it goes that much over or other time? Speaking, Mr. Chair, yeah. thank you uh, for asking the question. Um, in October last year, we lost one of our our compliance officer and permitting technician. Mm -hmm. They started falling behind. So, as I was discussing previously, yeah. we we uh, had a vacant position. And then we filled it in January, and we're getting the new staff member trained to catch up. They're taking the new items, which is the, the shorter timelines you're seeing. And then the, the reason why we had that backlog was because we were a little short staff for a period of about three months. Okay, thank you. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is why the, the variation, I thought it would be more homogenous that they would all be going over by the same amount of time if it's just staff and shortage. Or was it, are these permits dealt with by different staff? Um, so the, the, the department that was short is those permits. Is that how they're split up? Is that why we're seeing variation in times they go over? The three, mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, yes, um, there is a bit of that going on. And as I was saying, we're training. So uh, the easier and new items that are coming in are getting dealt with more quickly. And then the, the other staff member that was work, is working on the harder, um, larger applications as well, but she is why there's a big variation. So we're trying to do what instead of just falling behind it constantly, we're trying to hit the, the the pile from opposite ends where it's like new to oldest or oldest to new, and we're switching on uh, bad phrase. Um, more of the, we're taking the pile of job of tasks and attacking it on the opposite ends. Okay. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right, I'll put the motion on the floor. Uh, move that the following uh, Section 20 permits issued by staff be received. Uh, permits 2022-405, uh, 2023-023 to 2023-059, and that the permitting performance report be received. If I can get a mover and a seconder, please. Thank you. And a seconder. Thank you very much. And a vote, please. That is passed. Thank you very much. And Matt, I will let you keep going if you want to take us through the annual permitting report, please. Thank you again, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> As found on page 30 of the agenda, agenda, the annual report has been prepared to summarize how Port Conservation at both the Conservation Ontario Client Services and Streamlining Initiative, <clears throat> which should be noted, has tighter timelines than the provincial reporting requirements, which we are also reporting on. Um, in this regard, Forest Conservation met approximately 81% of the Conservation Ontario requirements in 2022 and 98% of the provincial requirements for issuing timelines in 2022. Um, with this in mind, we are seeking <clears throat> that the annual permitting report has been received. Thank you. Excellent. 
<laughs> Felix. <laughs> Killing it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <An engineer. laughs> Somebody wants to go home. Up <laughs> All right. Uh, any questions on the annual permitting report? Seeing none. All right. Uh, can I get a mover and seconder to receive the annual permitting performance report for 2022? Thank you. Thank you. And a vote, please. That is passed, thank you very much. And the permitting application for 60 Falls Bay Road, uh, is Matt, will you be leading that or will it be Massimo? Oh, I'll be leading okay, that. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, as found on page 36 of the agenda, a permit has been applied for to dredge an area of about 250 meters squared with an approximately 7,000 meters squared of Lacustrian uh, wetland for boat and lake access on Sturgeon Lake. The proposed dredging is contained within the applicant's property. Um, and since the proposed dredging is new in nature, our policies are not directly applicable in this scenario. It is of staff opinion that the dredging will have minimal impact on the water course. There will be no increased risk to public safety or property damage, and will provide a very small amount of additional flood storage within the body, water body within the property. Um, also, Sorry, can you say that last comment again? A very small amount of additional flood storage. Flood storage because they're going to be dredging and removing the dredge from the um, the part of the wetland that they're going to be digging up from to like their yeah. above water level land. There is no expectation of contaminated sediments in permit condition. <clears throat> excuse me. There is no expectation of contaminated sediments and. Uh, permit conditions will control the uh, sedimentation in the future while we're doing the work. Um, we say, seek with resolution that the permit submitted pursuant to Ontario Regulation 182-06, uh, Regulation of Development Interference with Wetlands and Operations to Shoreline and Water Courses to allow the dredging of 250 meters squared of wetland at 60 Falls Bay Road, City of Perth Lakes, and be approved and permitted. Thank you. Yes, sir. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Thank you, through you. Um, is, is that the area, the 40 by 70, is that what the request was specifically? Yes. Did it, was, was it ever considered that a smaller amount be removed? Something big enough, but not that big? We had several conversations with the applicant. They felt that this amount of land was to be dredged that was sufficient for them. But I, I guess my question is, could less of it be dredged? I mean, that, it, it seemed like quite a significant removal, actually. It may have been a, a smaller swath of the wetland away. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I believe that a smaller amount would be and could be addressed. Um, however, the applicant was um, firm on the amount of land that they requested at that time. And sorry, I think this was this uh, trying to understand. This was brought to us because it was slight, it's slightly ambiguous as how to approach it. Uh, yeah. So what uh, through you, Mr. Chair? The reason why it's before uh, the board is we did not include a new dredge uh, uh, policy in our board approved policy. So as a result, anything that does not meet the policies comes before the board. I see. And uh, and so what we what we do is we have. Uh, um, two options at that point. One is if staff uh, support the application, uh, and that's under consideration of all the natural uh, hazard considerations uh, that we're responsible for looking at protection of people, property, uh, and, um, and making sure there's no uh, additional flooding impacts. Um, th those are the decisions that we were able to base our, our uh, decisions on. Uh, and so staff would evaluate that if we feel that natural hair, uh, hazard, I always want to say heritage, um, naturally hazard considerations um, won't be impacted, then we put it forward to the board uh, in this kind of format. If we don't believe that, uh, that natural hazards have been adequately compensated, then we go to a hearing. So your uh, primary so concern is the hazards and not the overall health of the lake? Uh, yes, because we're limited in scope. Right. Uh, so, so it's you all able to really consider that. I guess that's where my questions are. Yeah. 
Yeah, if, if, and through you, Mr. Chair, if we're, and this is where the heritage side comes in. Uh, if we're looking at it from a heritage standpoint, as an ecological value of wetlands, yeah. then that to me is a different matter, but that's not what a regulation addresses. You're not uh, right so we have to kind of scope our, our kind of focus uh, quite a bit more on the, on the regs. And, uh, and that's something um, uh, that is also geared in, I know we're gonna take out the Bill 23, but that's also what Bill 23 was trying to do is make sure yeah. that the scoping of- uh, very limited. Yeah, was, was geared only to natural hazards. I, I think some of the uh, decisions that were identified before were given the, uh, probably the province some pause uh, and that they're maybe including other things uh, in the decision-making process, maybe more on the like, ecological side, or, or at least maybe that's the, the view that they were taking. But uh, so we, we've always been pretty, pretty rigid uh, in that it has to be on the natural hazard basis as opposed to you know other heritage concerns. Well, and it was the landowner who got to determine the exact size of this removal. He was determined, so you guys felt you had to fall in with his thinking on that. Yeah, well, that was, uh, it's always a discussion point uh, at that at that rate, which is where the discussions were had. Um, and landowner was not willing to, you know, kind of move from that. Uh, we looked at it from a hazard standpoint, uh, no fill going in, in fact, it's going out. Uh, so that's the flood storage capacity. Uh, there's no building on there. Uh, and uh, in terms of the flow of the water, it's a huge, you know, it's a, it's a lake uh, as opposed to a, a water course. Provincially, they're considered water courses. Uh, we consider them more lakes, but the impact on that was, uh, you know, again, it was pretty minimal. So right. there wasn't anything that we were looking at as staff that addressed that hazard side. And he has hardscaping, not softscaping. Yeah. 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 Okay. I've just, I've, it's really interesting to learn yeah. all of that. So yeah. Yeah. Thank it's you. a, you. Yeah, it's a mind bend sometimes, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we're like doing it, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really a matter of scoping. Yeah. Uh, and just being aware of that, uh, so part of this is also looking at uh, decisions rendered uh, and in rendering a decision, um, like if it was to go to a hearing, for instance, um, then we would actually cut the conversation short and then we would go to a, to a hearing at that point. But in the uh, decision at a hearing, um, what would happen is the decisions have to be based on, on that hazard component again, yeah. and it can be challenged um, as well at two different levels. Uh, so one with the province and then if the province doesn't render a decision within a certain time period, it can go to LPAT um, or, or even both. So, uh, so that's where, you know, kind of looking at the decision-making process and going down the line, you have to be kind of solid on that decision-making at the, at the front end. Uh, so, so it's consideration of all those, all those factors in this. And this, this was one that, uh, that we uh, honestly wrestled with as, as staff um, and ended up uh, where we were, well, where we are today. Actually, could I ask another question about wetlands? So where, um, where we have um, people building into some of our wetlands on our rural concessions, um, it's not so much um, uh, flood hazard. I mean, that might be part of it, but it's, it's much more than that. It's more the ecosystem. It's more the, the value of that wetland. So are the CAs right now not permitted to work to sort of get involved in those um, situations as well? So, yeah, I can think of one where a guy's building a road into a wetland in yeah. my ward, yeah. and um, he's not creating a flood hazard so much as just, you know, pulling out a yeah. wetland. Yeah, so for you, Mr. Chair, that's a very um, interesting scenario. Uh, if the landowner, and it, it given us a wetland, a wetland by definition is hit under a regulation. So there's four different tests that have to be met for a wetland to exist under the reg, uh, which is different than the uh, PPS definition, the Planning Act definition. So our definition is just a bit different. Um, and if it meets those four tests, um, then it would require a permit. Uh, so if there is a permit for that, then it would have been evaluated. Uh, if they don't have a permit, then the CA would uh, would have to be involved in some way because it would be doing work without a permission. Right. And so if if a permit is is given, uh, then it's a permission to do the work. And if the zone just goes ahead and does the work anyway, then it's uh, it falls into the enforcement compliance realm. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. at that point. I don't think a permit would be given in this instance. Yeah. And yeah, and so in giving a permit, some of the considerations would be, um, you know, what's the flow of water through the wetland? Uh, you know, so wetlands usually are one of two varieties, uh, but a lot of them are sponges, right? So they, they help attenuate flooding flows. Uh, some of them actually provide water uh, recharge. Uh, as well. So it just depends a little bit on the type of wetland, but essentially you still want the flow going through. Uh, so there'd have to be uh, looking at culverts and things of like that to make sure that flows occur. Um, flooding is a, is a concern as well. So there'd have to be safe access egress uh, to the site. Um, and the difference here is that it's a boat. Uh, there's not going to be a traffic flow. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so the ability for vehicular access and, and being able to access a property in a, uh, in a flooding event is going to be important. Um, and uh, and those are the ones that are coming to my mind right off the top. Uh, there might be a few others that uh, uh, considerations, uh, you know, some design considerations in the mix. But, uh, but yeah, those, those would be some of the, the high level factors. Any other questions on this? Okay, seeing none. Uh, motion is uh, that the permit application submitted by submitted pursuant to Ontario Regulation 182 06, uh, regulation of development, interference with wetlands, and alteration to the shorelands and watercourses be allowed the dredging of a 250 square meter of wetland at 20 Falls Bay Road, City of Gortha, be approved and permitted. If I can get a mover and a second, please. Thank you. Seconder, thank you very much. And a vote on that, please. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And that is passed. Um, we'll be moving past 7.4 and we'll be going to 7.5, the CAO report. So, Mark, if you can lead us through that, please. Great. And uh, what I'll do, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, is I'll, I'll try and keep this uh, uh, brief and I'll also make sure my eyes are going to be able to read this. Um, uh, so uh, just as a, a quick summary, and all of our directors are available for, for questions as well in the individual program areas. Um, uh, we've, uh, we've been busy with some of the legislative changes over the last month, uh, Bill 23, and some of the implications uh, coming out that affect our business. Um, and that's on the planning uh, side for the most part, uh, but also prepping a little bit on the regulation side. Uh, the, uh, the other aspect is, of course, the transition phase from... Uh, from where we are currently in our, our programs to developing MOUs with municipalities for category two, three programs. Uh, so there's been a number of uh, meetings that I've been a, a part of as part of our CAO group across all 36 CAs, um, which have been uh, very beneficial. And I've got my eye on a couple of different uh, samples for uh, reasonable agreements, I think, that aren't too laborious uh, in content and, uh, and give a good kind of framework to, to work from. Uh, and uh, one of the things I want to do is work within our existing budgeting process uh, so it makes it uh, simpler to, to work with. Um, uh, and, uh, and then just as a bit of an additional is the category three programs are uh, five, I think it's 5% uh, of our budget overall, uh, which is a pretty small amount and two and a half percent of that is actually uh, uh, sustained by revenues. Uh, so one of those we highlight a little bit later, which is the uh, innovation program uh, that we have, the innovation hub. Uh, where we're, I think, quite frankly, I think we're providing all the septic inspector training in the in the province uh, right now. They're fully subscribed and uh, and very popular. So uh, so that is actually a program that uh, we're able to support things that we want to want to do, which is a good uh, responsible management of septic systems across the board. Uh, but uh, but it's revenue neutral for mm -hmm. us, or even a little better. Uh, so uh, so it's uh, great for uh, for the work we do, and great for uh, for everyone. I think uh, that's taking part of that and, and getting the designations. Uh, included a bunch of information on communications, which I always find uh, interesting uh, from a data driven standpoint, which drives how we communicate with our our audience and uh, being able to provide you know, good information on a variety of platforms that hit all different age groups. And uh, so some of the things that we highlight in there is that uh, we're seeing a different demographic uh, starting to creep in right now, which is uh, interesting. We see it in our conservation areas uh, on almost a daily basis now. Uh, and we're seeing that in the communication metrics uh, that we have too. So we're trying to make some additional efforts in, in communicating it. Uh, uh, and our website is well geared towards uh, reaching those audiences with uh, Google Translate, one of the new things with our, our website. So, uh, so that's, that's great. Um, John's been extremely busy on his end with his team, uh, finalizing year-end 
stuff, I'll call it. Um, <laughs> but it's a, it's a bunch of different uh, pieces of legislation, T4s and uh, MFIPA is, a, is another one that uh, we provide reports for. Uh, that one I'm involved in, so I have a better, better idea of that one. But, uh, but John's got uh, something like four or five, six um, times 10 items uh, that relate back to uh, closing year end and uh, make sure things are set up. So, uh, and then the auditors as well. We have brand new auditors. So whenever you would know as you get new auditors, there's a lot more stuff to do um, as well to make sure that they're uh, uh, they're satisfied uh, because so you have a working relationship with uh, with an auditor for a time. They get familiar with your business and uh, 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 and then they're able to kind of proceed as a um, uh, go forward as opposed to just learning about the. Uh, uh, the organization. So, uh, so there's been a lot of work on on that end, as well as uh, the budget uh, preparation of the 2023 budget, um, and asset management plan uh, is pretty active on on that front too. A number of meetings with uh, uh, with consultants on that end, and we're well on our way to uh, to meeting our timelines on that one. Uh, and that is our very first asset management plan too. Uh, so, so tremendous. Um, there's a couple other policies that we implemented from a uh, health and safety standpoint, uh, um, and that's uh, tied in with some of the legislation that the province gave it, health and safety, um, more, more HR, I guess, uh, uh, than anything else, disconnecting from work and electronic monitoring. So, uh, so those were hit this year because we had the 25 uh, person limit, uh, and there was a bit of a um, an allowance within the legislation if you didn't have the 25 and we're just under in the last year so uh, so we were now obligated to uh, to make sure that all of those policies were in place uh, which we did um, and uh, we had a great uh, meeting as well within the CA side of things uh, uh, Durham East Cross Forest we received some grant funding to develop an eco corridor um, in that area and it's, a, it's an area that we've always been wrestling with uh, as you know might know um, this was an area where there's a lot of uh, uh, activity that was occurring with off-roading. Uh, we don't allow it in our area. Um, and every every so often, it seems fairly frequently, every couple of years or so, the, um, the hydro crews would come in and uh, um, would uh, trim the vegetation uh, that would grow a little taller and start interfering with their their operational uh, work. So we're looking at fixing that. Um, and of course, with doing the fix, it would be shorter plants. Uh, so they wouldn't have to go in and uh, and disturb the area. And when they do go in there, I don't know, uh, I would say just trying to clear the land as opposed to looking for ecological sensitivities uh, in that area. So uh, so we're we're uh, pretty proud to uh, uh, be uh, striking a, a partnership with, uh, with the Mississauga as a First Nation to kind of look at uh, some options and how we might be able to uh, incorporate um, uh, some things that they're interested in, in in that area. So I uh, had a great meeting with our, our director, uh, uh, Jeff Forbes, and, uh, and some of the MSIFN uh, staff on, on that end. So uh, so that was great, really, really exciting meeting. Um, actually, I'm going to mention this one because it's kind of exciting too. Uh, we've, uh, and you might be doing this in municipalities, but GovDeals is a, is a website uh, is kind of tied in with our, our website now with the, um, with our new look. And this is the first time we've trialed it. Uh, so what we've been able to do is, is uh, actually create some surplus uh, funding for things that we would normally dispose of without, uh, without any gain to us. It would cost us to get rid of materials. Uh, and we've actually had some good successes on computer equipment and a couple of vehicles that uh, were uh, rusting out uh, a fair bit at the end of their lifespan. So, uh, so that was great. And the returns were better than, uh, than what we've, we've seen uh, traditionally. I won't talk about Matt's uh, department uh, too much other than happy to work with uh, with your uh, township, uh, Peter, on the floodplain studies uh, that are, are underway. So we've had a kickoff on that, which is tremendous. And uh, and in stewardship, things are just rolling forward. We're going to exceed targets from a uh, uh, planting perspective uh, by quite a bit. Um, and I think with that, I will uh, kind of stop it there and uh, just mention I haven't mentioned a few areas of, of work that we're doing but uh, but the report covers it off I know Nancy's department I haven't talked about it at all um, but uh, but in the interest of time there's a, the report there their team's doing great work as well uh, looking at modernizing and providing information Excellent. any questions on the CAO report
Okay. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to, to go through it, I, I did have a chance to go through it. And there, there is a lot of great work that's being done. Um, so please uh, make sure you, you read through to, to see all of the other things that we we didn't cover um, in, in the meeting. So with that, um, can I have a motion to receive the monthly CAO report? Thank you. Thank you. And a vote on that, please. Perfect, that is carried. Uh, Mark, do you want to talk about the correspondence? Yep, sure, one item of correspondence that was received and it's uh, related to the modernization of the Class EA process uh, by the minister. So that's uh, uh, about all I'll mention on, on that one, so. Perfect, uh, any questions on that correspondence? All right, can I get a mover and seconder to receive the attached correspondence report? Thank you, seconder, thank you. And a vote on that, please. Perfect, thank you very much. And we will move on to action item 8.1, the Conservation Authorities Act Transition Report. Great, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the uh, the transition report that is geared towards the, um, I believe it was you kind of mix up the acts after a while, but I think it was Bill 229 uh, that implemented this change. And that is from how we do business now to the category one, two, three programs and the MOUs. Uh, so as part of that transition uh, work, uh, there's the requirement to provide progress updates to the ministry on a quarterly basis. So this is the fourth quarterly report. The report was attached to, um, to the presentation. There's a number of things that have to be addressed as well in the, in the updates. So those were included in the progress report to the ministry and also into the inventory of uh, programs and services that were approved by the board at the last meeting. So uh, there is a requirement to forward uh, the inventory to the province uh, whenever there's an update. And uh, so that's why it's included as, uh, as part of the progress report and, uh, and then detailed as well in some of the, some of the words uh, that are included in the report itself. So, uh, so it's an administrative uh, component that's uh, uh, before everyone today, before I actually submit it uh, this time, uh, just do some of the, uh, um, uh, well, just some of the circumstances and timing. Uh, so, uh, so it's for, uh, for you for, uh, for endorsement. Perfect. Anything else that you like to add? Um, the only other thing I'll mention is, uh, the MOUs are, uh, are a big piece of this and mm -hmm. moving forward. So, uh, just looking to working forward, uh, looking forward, working with municipalities to develop those, uh, uh starting with, uh, CAOs and, uh, and their support staff to, uh, to get those going. Yeah, perfect. And, and actually that's a perfect transition. Uh, I have a question around the MOUs themselves. When we're looking at the January 1st, 2024 date, is that the execution date of them or is that the, the sort of start? Yeah. The starting point of creating them. Yes, uh, yes, thank you. So that is when the province wants them to be essentially active. Okay. Uh, so December 31st, they would have to be signed, executed, done. Um, we're trying to hit a little bit before then mm -hmm. uh, because uh, if there's there's two things at play. One is the budget for mm -hmm. the new year, uh, and what the province has said <laughs> is if you don't have the agreements in place, you can't do the programs. Right. Uh, and so those would be all the category two and three type programs. Uh, and that would be uh, things like our regular monitoring uh, that we do. So anything aside from the provincial programs, uh, like management planning, uh, for instance, the monitoring that goes behind that, any floodplain projects, uh, things of that nature, they all need the MOUs to be in place. Uh, so it's, a, it's an important uh, component of work that we do to make sure it's in there and that facilitates the 2024 budget to move forward. Um, the other piece in behind it is uh, there's an extension possibility. So although, um, although the province has said, you know, January 1st, 2024, they have to be in place, there is an ability for the minister to extend. That. And uh, one of the things that we've been clear in our progress report is when you keep... Um, modifying the legislative framework specific to what we do. It requires us to adapt mm -hmm. and uh, and requires our municipalities to adapt, uh, specifically Bill 23 mm -hmm. uh, is pretty, uh, pretty significant. So uh, when that happens, it's a lot harder to get the stuff done. Uh, so we've been pretty uh, straightforward since the second uh, progress report that we submitted uh, on that end. So. I just got to ask a quick follow-up on that. Uh, 
Have, what is the process that you're looking at to create the MOUs? Did you want to work with one municipality to create a template to approach the others, or are you trying to do them sort of all at the same time? Yeah, I think uh, I know some CAs have looked at all municipalities and signing the agreements all at the same time. Uh, that's not something I think is uh, the model I'm looking at. Okay. Um, I'm looking at each municipality. Uh, right. And that makes it easier to manage long term too. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to get new signatories every time you change something with one municipality or another. Right. Uh, and the way that I want to work it is uh, is that you have uh, one like super agreement almost. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's add ons like service level agreements that might come a little bit later, right. you can just add it on without updating the entire agreement. So it's just right. a schedule that gets uh, updated. Um, and then referencing the uh, budget process mm -hmm. as the approval mechanism right. uh, to me is is makes sense because it's already getting approved by council as it, as it is but for the expenditures. So, and all the details are as well in terms of the projects and the outcomes. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, through you. Um, with some of the services that the CAs can't provide with Bill 23, um, you know, except for those uh, projects that had already begun and the MOUs not being sort of ready to go till January 24, are there some gray areas or are there places when the CAs will still continue providing some of those um, development services on, on development applications for now? Is that how it's? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So through you, Mr. Chair, you're talking about the natural heritage commenting yeah. on development applications. Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's an interesting, interesting one. And uh, um, you probably would have seen some reference to that in the Bill 23 that we that we pulled, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll mention yeah. a little bit. Sure. So, uh, so what we're doing on that end is we will um, have to revise the MOUs that we have with our municipalities because it does very specifically say that uh, we'll comment on those bases. And it wasn't just natural heritage. Uh, it took out um, uh, our reviews for water features, uh, so sensitive water features. And, uh, and took out uh, natural heritage and, uh, and one other component as well. Um, uh, so, so it took out things that were well known for, um, which, was, uh, which was kind of uh, interesting. So we can only comment on natural hazards uh, right. straight through. And the um, municipalities didn't have the capacity to take yeah. over these other services. Yes. They had a one shop, yeah. one window shop shopping with the CAs and then yeah. that was, but are we just bumbling along with, until? Uh, yeah, I think yeah. bumbling along would almost be a good term. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so what we've been doing is uh, we've been trying to, background is the, uh, it was December 28th, uh, we got a letter from the uh, province saying January 1st, yeah. um, it's implemented, right? So two days over Christmas holidays is not enough time with a staff holiday in the mix. Um, so, uh, so there wasn't enough time for anyone really to adapt. Uh, and uh, so what we've been doing, they also, we, we were as a group of 36 CAs saying uh, transition uh, would be a good thing. And I think municipalities were advocating for that as well. Uh, that was not provided, uh, even though that was brought forward to the province. Um, so I think uh, what, uh, what the message was at that point, at least from uh, my standpoint, um, and that was uh, similar to a lot of other, most of the other CAs as well, was um, there needs to be a transition period. You can't just drop something, leave everyone in the lurch, and that doesn't really meet the objectives of the province either uh, in terms of facilitating development and getting it through. Yeah. Uh, so what we tried to do is look at that uh, client-centric approach uh, from two different perspectives, from uh, anyone that was applying for a permit, or permit, a planning approval, and from the municipality side, because those were you know, who we were serving. So. Uh, what we've done is said uh, there's a pretty clear line in terms of January 1st. Uh, so January 1st, uh, we're not commenting on natural heritage anymore. Um, but what we tried to do was help the municipalities uh, out in their decision-making process. Uh, so we would uh, comment on the natural hazards. Um, and we would say, you know, uh, through an email to, instead of formal letterhead, we would say, here's some considerations on the natural heritage side. It's always a comment that we provide anyway. We have delegated natural hazard responsibilities from the province. Um, we never had uh, delegated natural heritage uh, comments to the municipalities. So 
Uh, so we we didn't provide them as I would say official comments, but uh, more provide them to the planners and and let them know that you know by March, uh, you know that's that's our cutoff in order to try try and achieve our our compliance with uh, Bill 23. Um, so that's how we've been uh, building on that end was uh, was trying to facilitate what essentially the province is trying to achieve, uh, which gives the time to get a, a consultant in play. Um, or maybe develop some some sort of background to be able to to get to that point. So um, so it's a I would say messy uh, as a result, um, but it's based on the the lack of a transition period too. Yeah. Uh, Thank to goodness that messiness is there as opposed to a real disaster. Yeah, yeah. and and the and we as a collective uh, you know kind of put that forward to the province as I said, but uh, there was nothing forthcoming. So I th and they didn't push back either, mm -hmm. right? So uh, saying no, you know. There needs to be, there, there, uh, you know, it needs to be dropped entirely, right? So, so we just took it at that point as we'll move forward and try and make sure that uh, you know the system still works, but uh, with a with a definite uh, stop uh, at some point. So, yeah. yeah. Quick question to that point: Are the would you be in a position if municipalities came to outsource the work that historically you had done instead of getting a different consultant coming to you know, can municipalities essentially go back to the CAs and outsource that that through them, whether that's through a, a part of an MOU or no. through an SLA? No, no we were, uh, it is uh, very clear in the legislation that we cannot provide that service as a category two, which is what it was, mm -hmm. or a category three. Okay. Uh, so there's no ability for that to happen until the legislation changes. Okay. So specifically, there is no no facility for a municipality to yeah. outsource that that no, work. Not not there has to be someone. Yeah, else it has to be a consultant. Okay. I just want to make sure. Has to be a consultant or internal expertise. Right. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on on that? No other questions. Okay. Uh, the motion uh, for 8.1 is uh, we move that the uh, April 1st, 2023 progress update report uh, and circulation to the MECP and member municipalities in accordance with Ontario Regulation 687 slash 21 be ratified and that the staff report on phase two transition activities related to Conservation Authorities Act changes be received. Can I get a mover and a second, please? Thank you. Thank you. And a vote, please. Thank you very much. All right. And we now move on to 8.2, Board of Directors remuneration. And um, scrolling to the area here. All right, so uh, board of directors remuneration. This was a request uh, from uh, from the previous uh, board meeting. So uh, John's been uh, and John can provide uh, a mm -hmm. lot of details on on this. Uh, uh, but there is a we were able to gain information from the other CAs on on their per diems, uh, which uh, which John has uh, summarized in in this report. Uh, average is about sixty seven dollars. Uh, max is seventy five. Historically, we provided 60, um, and uh, and the information is uh, presented uh, in a couple of different forms for for your consumption. So, uh, we we anticipate that uh, depending on how you slice and dice it, it would cost anywhere from uh, about four thousand dollars to about fifty three hundred dollars, more or less. Um, and uh, so that would be the budgetary impact. Uh, be a little bit of staff time to process. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, some additional work. I think T4s is what uh, you mentioned, John. Yeah, uh, some additional T4s and just uh, getting together with the team and just looking at a T4, T4A process, but beyond the initial, through research here, through, beyond the initial input there, um, just to establish a process that wouldn't be uh, a major at uh, all. So just to clarify on, on that particular topic, the actual, beyond the budgetary impact of the, the cost of whatever the rate uh, that was set was. What would you be looking at from a staff perspective of time to create the additional administration that would be associated with that work? Just so we had a full, you know, we had a full idea of not only would it cost, say, $5,000 just for the cost of remuneration, but what are the associated ongoing staff time, whether it's the monthly or quarterly, you know, 
the creation of the payments or and then all of the associated reporting government required government reporting with that yeah for sure um through so gee mr chair on the initial lay we just have to look into a process mm -hmm. uh, we haven't had per dms uh, since before my time at court the conservation so just going to finesse with the team just you know some of the uh, specific legislation and make sure going through the T4, T4A process. So I think mm -hmm. once we get past that point, I mean, on an annual basis, we're already processing about, uh, I think last year was around 42 uh, T4s. Right. So we'd be just adding another seven into the mix. And we're already going through that process and we have a pretty efficient process, mm -hmm. whether it be our annual T4 process or our uh, biweekly uh, payments or payroll. So right. it would just be molded into that process. So I okay. would see an incremental amount, like we're, right. maybe I'd say, on a quarterly basis, one to two staff hours. Okay. Um, so it's not going to be a massive impact, you know, from the first year perspective to get this set up. No, It'll no, be no. relatively minimal from an administrative perspective outside of whatever the budget to, to do the payments would be. There wouldn't be a ton of added expense for that. Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I just want to make sure we were fully aware of all of the potential costs beyond just the, the amount uh, of that. Yes, I appreciate that. Excellent. Anything else you want to add? Anything you want to add on that? I mean, you've done the research. It was a great sort of cross section of the information that's in, in there. Um, nothing else to, it's kind of in, in the bulk. So what if I read this sort of the ballpark that theoretically we'd be looking at is anywhere from like 60 to 75 is how I, I interpret what you're having in here. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, Somewhere in that range between those two things is kind of... That's a fair assessment. So what I had done is I've gone out into my network with mm -hmm. the CAs and collected this information from 25 of them. And then I just wanted to take another level and actually look at from a wealth perspective, which is how we come up with kind of here. It's kind of interesting to see mm -hmm. you know, the sliding scale from larger to smaller CAs yep. there. Um, so I would agree with your statement there. And even if you go a bump up or a bump below on that total budget amount, right. it's still within that same goal. There. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, uh, questions? Um, I'd like to thank staff for um, responding to this request and um, providing a fulsome report. And um, I'd like, is it, is it, is it uh, acceptable that I make a recommendation based on this? Well, definitely. I think I, I, before we get to that stage, I, I would like to just make sure we have everybody gets the, any questions that they have about the process. And then by all means, if you want to, I, I mean, there, we all we have a sort of rough motion on the floor, but we, you know, we haven't put anything definitive. So I think what I'd like to see is, is essentially to, to talk about this in two stages, if we don't mind. One, are, are we as a group amenable to even the idea of the process, and then secondly, debating what that may be if we are amenable to the process. So does anyone have any other questions, observations, feedback on the idea of the per diem? Yes, sir. Just a comment that uh, most of the CAs are, are paying their members. Mm -hmm. I believe there were only two that weren't. So it, it, three. Three? Yeah. Okay. But, but the norm is mm -hmm. that they pay the numbers. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, we put a lot of work into reading our agendas and attending our meetings. And mm -hmm. uh, I think some compensation is due. Okay, that's great. Um, any other comments, either of you? On the, the concept of it? Yes, sir. Um, so what, in fairness, do we do for the members from the board? Will be my next point. I was waiting for <laughs> yes. you know, Like I'm, I have certainly no issues with the PUD, and I, it's, it's, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But it, they're not allowed to accept it. I understand that correctly. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, they're not. And I was wondering, are they compensated in some other way because it says where it's already covered by the municipality? So, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's specific. Legis bylaw legislation in Kortha, which doesn't allow them to be paid per diems for participating in committees. Yes. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the municipality, uh, uh, City of Court Lakes, they've, uh, what they've done is they went through a process to look at their compensation uh, as a municipality for their members. And, uh, and so they, I believe they bumped up those numbers quite significantly from where they used to be. Um, and, and then as part of that, what they, what they included was, uh, uh, since they are acting on behalf of, uh, of the organization and, you know, through this kind of larger exercise, 
um, that uh, that they not um, receive the per diems from other organizations that they really represent the city from, which is, I think uh, we did a little bit of analysis on this uh, uh, when it first came up at budget a couple of years ago, uh, maybe two or three years ago. And there was a difference between what the city had done and what all of the other municipalities had done. So in other words, they're already being compensated. So they're, yeah, the city considers them to be compensated yeah. through, through, uh, through the efforts that, uh, that they've made on, on that compensation analysis. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it is a bit different. And uh, Mr. Chair, if I could almost suggest something as well. Yes, please do. Um, it is a little bit striking um, that the city members aren't here when we're talking about the <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, so, uh, so there is always an option to receive the report and defer it to, mm -hmm. for discussion or you know mm -hmm. have something along those lines, just to make sure they're part of that. Uh, but I leave that up to, to everyone's yeah. kind of wisdom right. around the table. I, heard, I, I did hear from some of them personally, mm -hmm. and they said that they were all for it. Right. So I, you know, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've been in, as I was going to say, I wanted to put that on the floor, the idea that the, the three members who would not be able to participate in it invariably were not here. So I, I would really like to hear from them, whether they, they don't care or <laughs> whatever that would be. But I think because it is, uh, because it is an important topic, I, I really feel as though I would like to have more people around the table to have a conversation than just barely have quorum. Um, so I would prefer to defer this to April to allow them to participate in the conversation. So I, I, I would like to put that forward as a motion that we receive the report, we can consider and come back to the table with the idea of what um, what we would feel potentially that would be if this were to move forward, um, but to, to just simply have more people around the table to have a bit of a, a fuller conversation. So I, I would, sorry, go ahead. And, and just further to that as well, um, it could be retroactive, right? Mm -hmm. As a as a recommendation, so it's mm -hmm. you know just a uh, yeah, it's a, it's an option uh, to to not just from here forward, yeah. but if it's a good idea, it's a it's generally a good idea. So, so it can be retroactive so back to the beginning yeah. of the term. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is everybody okay? Can I have a mover and seconder yeah, I was to, going to make motion to uh, de defer that? Perfect. To thank you very much. Meeting. Thank you, and the seconder. Thank you, and can we vote, please? Excellent. Okay, that is carried. So uh, thank you very much for the work that was done on this. Uh, John, there's a lot of great information. Um, so uh, we'll defer that uh, to the next time. And uh, again, the recommendation could be based uh, on retroactive. So uh, John or Mark, or who's going to be um, leading retroactive? I'll let, uh, this is John's baby. Um, so I'll let him uh, uh, tackle this one. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, I'm just going to move a bit closer so I can hear near that microphone there. So through you, Mr. Chair, today we present to the board the 2023 draft budget. Uh, this draft budget was developed in um, conjunction with the guidelines provided by the board in July 2022. And then we reconfirmed those guidelines at our AGM in February of 2023. Um, within those, so I'm just going to go over our operating levy, our operating programs, our uh, special benefiting, our general benefiting, and then touch on the various um, timelines and uh, municipal correspondence we've had to date. So through our municipal operating levy, uh, we have an increase at 3.75% as directed by the board, which equates to a $62,000 year over year increase for our uh, operating program. So our 2023 budget is reflective of later labor impacts and uh, pressures on wages we experienced in 2022. Uh, we're retaining a similar or steady FDE count uh, year over year as well at 28 staff. And we've also had impacts under OMR's legislation, similar to all the municipalities with the expansion of the NFT expansion, which has allowed for a contract at seasonal staff to opt into that OMR's program. So there are some expenditures um, incurred with that. Additionally, our 2023 programs are focused on uh, primarily our, what we'll call the category one programs moving forward into 2024. Um, as, and as previously mentioned, the budget also accounts for adjustments in services that we've seen inflationary pressures or renewals in our contracts. So we've gone out to RFP for uh, our audit, which was appointed last month, um, new janitorial services, and then the insurance industry has been seeing um, increases just from the cost perspective of risk assessment and that buildings are uh, incrementally increasing. So if there's a disaster or building uh, impact, the cost to rebuild this building or say another has uh, outpaced the cost of inflation as well. 
Um, just to provide a summary on our special projects. So for City of Kawartha Lakes and Durham Region, these are ongoing special projects that we have in place. Um, we were able to maintain a 2% increase for the City of Kawartha Lakes projects. And then with uh, the region of Durham, we had uh, worked towards a 1.5% increase as per their guidance um, we received in February. So we had to adjust our budget to meet these guidelines. Additionally, we are going to be completing a uh, new special project as Mark had previously mentioned. And with Matthew, with uh, Trent Lakes, so we we're going to be completing two floodplain mapping studies that are underway. So we had worked with uh, Trent Lakes last year to secure funding um, through them. So the grants under their name, and we're going to be a primary lead on this floodplain mapping project. So they were able to recover, I think, 50% expenditures on this project that we're supporting. So that is a new uh, special benefiting uh, levy for Trent Lakes that you'll see in the budget. Through our general benefiting, um, we continue our digitization strategy. So this is basically the scanning of all of our corporate records. We have a lot of old paper records dating back you know, to the 80s, um, back to when we started in 1979. Um, so this project's been ongoing for, I want to say, four years now, five years, but to date we've scanned over 290,000 records, and it's just uh, tremendously increased our efficiency and ability to pull records, especially when you're dealing with um, active files or files from uh, past times, um, and especially during the pandemic when we moved into that more remote hybrid model to get through um, those times. Um, our website project have completed, so you'll see that dropping off the budget in 2023. Um, with and that was primarily related to the um, integration of our website into our information management system to streamline, you know, manual input from what's going in one system to the other. And we're implementing our um, ten-year environmental monitoring strategy. So this was a strategy that was endorsed by the board last year to enhance our monitoring network strategy. So overall, um, with these changes, the dropping of one project and implementation of the new one, we're looking at a $5,000 increase for our general benefiting project. And I'm just looking at where we are in the process. So we had, I've mentioned we confirmed our guidelines in July of 2022. We had reconfirmed them at our last meeting. And today we're bringing forward the first uh, full in-depth draft budget to the board of directors. So based on any direction today or input, we will bring forward a second draft uh, budget um, that would also be inclusive if there's any direction on per diem, for example, uh, to the board in April. From April, if we receive approval to move forward to a circulated, uh, to approve the budget and circulate it under the CA Act, our budgets have to be uh, circulated for 30 days. That would then bring us to the May board meeting where we'd be able to have a final weighted vote at the board meeting. Um, with that being said, um, we have been, I have been in constant contact working with our municipalities, um, City of Kawartha Lakes. We've completed a budget presentation there back in January, as I mentioned at the last board meeting. Um, their budget process has been now completed, actually, I believe, and approved, um, and working with our other partners to uh, onboard, for example, Trent Lakes with this new floodplain mapping project. So that's just a general summary, and thank you for allowing me to uh, provide a summary there. I'm open for any questions that you might have on the budget. Questions for John on the draft budget? Okay, seeing none. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, there's a ton of information in here. Um, so I know uh, we, we've given it a really cursory uh, glance of it, but uh, there's a ton of very detailed information in here, and, and I uh, appreciate the level of detail. When I when I was reading through it in prep for the meeting, I, I was uh, it, worked well together um, uh, to give a good flow of information. So thank you very much for that. If there's no questions, I'll just put the motion on the floor. Um, we move that the draft budget of 2023 budget proceed um, with any changes identified uh, per, for direction and that the final draft be presented for approval to be circulated to the member municipalities at the April 27, 2023 Board, uh, direct, board of directors meeting. So I know we haven't done any changes as of yet. How does that impact your time frame if we were to make a decision on per diem at the next meeting? Yeah, that's not Are a problem. So in, no? okay. Yeah, so in the past when we've had, say, we might be at that final stage and there might be a revision, um, generally with the board we've worked through, say there is that revision, it would just be, I can make that update Fine and circulate. Before it gets circulated, we'll reflect that instead of waiting until the next okay. board meeting. That's if the board's comfortable with that. Right. Um, so I couldn't so make those changes and just- We could pre-approve 
the budget with the changes, we wouldn't have to necessarily yes. have the final in front of us. Okay, yes. I just want to make sure that's not going to screw up any of your timelines uh, to get what you need it done. Okay, perfect. All right, thank you very much. Motions on the floor. Um, mover and a seconder, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, vote, please. Perfect. That is unanimously carried. Thank you very much. Um, number nine. Do we have any new business to discuss? For new business. Uh, re any reports or any updates from board members on any any activities happening in their regions? Sunderland Maple uh, Maple Syrup Festival coming up April, April first weekend, the second week, yeah. April first. Perfect. 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 It's coming up next week. Yeah, next week. Next two weekends. Next two weekends. Very good. Nice. Excellent. So on that note, yep. Some people might not realize, but that big windstorm we had in the spring, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So when they lose a mature tree that's been tapped, you're looking at a 40 year recovery for that stock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the impact is is big on some of the people that were producing syrup this year mm -hmm. because that's the likelihood that we would. You lose twelve or fifteen trees in in one bush, right? Well, just just so that awareness. That's amazing yeah. to know. Yeah. And so I didn't mean it's on for two weekends. It's two weekends from now. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Any other updates? Do you wish a bit more of an update on the um, LSAT project of the like, assist with council, or is that um, does that mean you can now your thoughts, Sharon? I think um, Tanner did a good job. Of uh, yeah, I think I, I think we, very well. I think. Yeah, I, I would say you know to that point, the one uh, the one thing I will say that I don't know was included in the proposed timeline is there actually is going to be a second con uh, consultation period. And I don't know if that was captured just so everybody's aware. Once we get to a more detailed design or what is also referred to as a final design. Um, uh, uh, staff at the township have committed to doing an open house on the final design, um, and there will be a, an additional commenting period uh, on the final design prior to council doing a vote. Uh, that is the only, I would say, amendment to what I saw in the timeline. Uh, but I, there are the, a lot of other minor ones, but I don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some other concerns that sort of stretch outside of the uh, environmental impact of it <laughs> that are being discussed. But yeah, no, thank you for, very much for, uh, for bringing that up. Um, Anything else in particular that you want to mention on that? No, we're good. I'm not specifically. All right. And, and if uh, just put it out there, if uh, if uh, you did want uh, anyone to present to to mm -hmm. Scuba Council uh, a similar presentation what we had uh, today, then uh, we'd be happy to do so. So um, since Tanner's not here, I'll just volunteer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Tanner's volunteered. <laughs> We've dragged Tanner through a couple of me long meetings already. Uh, I'm sure he'll appreciate skipping one or two. But uh, yeah, no, I, for sure. And I know I know that you've always made yourself available, which is we all appreciate. Um, as we get through balancing some of the non-technical and technical uh, decisions. Yes, yeah, so I'm sure you're good. Like, yeah, maybe once we get final design, that, that might be something that would be appropriate yeah. if we see, because there, there are some minor changes that people are asking for in the mm -hmm. yeah. I think it maybe then would be appropriate thing to do. Thank you. Yeah, great. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I think we're all we're all anxious to get to a final design perspective so we can under get a better understanding of the budget. Which I think is, is going to be keenly, keenly yes. important to all of us. Is yeah. yes, we're hoping for the numbers to remain the same. Which is, mm -hmm. is, these are I, I, I yeah. literally I saw these numbers on dates in 2019 too. Yeah. So we're. We're suspect. We're hoping it's true. But you raised your taxes pretty high. <laughs> that's <laughs> not. Tax that's that's not really sure. <laughs> Actually, Harold, I will say, has, has a masterful way of explaining this, and I saw him do this in a in, in an informal meeting we have, and it's so bang on. It's great. I, ask him to ask him to do that for you later, because it's actually two point five. The eight point one is a bit of a misnomer, and he he's found a very Fun, succinct way of of okay, it. Yeah, yes. Sorry, yeah. I can't stay because I'm going to. A yeah, no, no worries. Jeff, Jeff has his hand. Jeff, do you have something? Sorry, I can't see him. I'm blind. <laughs> no problem at all. Uh, 
I just want to say that uh, we had a great meeting uh, excursion with uh, Christy and Mark over at Durham East Cross Forest. I don't know if I'm premature on this or if we can open it up, but we are talking about doing a uh, groundbreaking ceremony over there. So it'd be great to have the full board there if and when it does happen. Um, I did just look because I am away for our next board meeting. Um, we, we're traveling. So uh, I do apologize in advance. I won't be here. So I know it is coming up to spring and uh, our sugar bush is rocking. We're going out, uh, <laughs> yes. out there again tomorrow. So we've uh, <laughs> like we've already made five pounds of sugar or more. So yeah, we're boiling it straight down to straight down to sugar, not not syrup. So it's, it's going really, really well. So but, uh, I'm yeah, hearing I have to come across the street with maybe, <laughs> with maybe drinks in hand as a gift. <laughs> uh, bribes are always uh, taken. <laughs> trade, right? Trade. Trade. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll take the so, long, arduous walk over to your property. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, miigwech for that. And uh, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff going around town about the. Uh, the Scugog Enhancement Project, and we really hope that uh, Port Perry Council and uh, and staff and everybody realize how needed that is for that lake. You know, over over a hundred years ago, it was rice fields, and they are starting to reclaim back into swamp. Um, they cannot sustain. You know, why when I was a kid, we used to be able to swim at Kingsman's Beach. You can't do anything now. Now. You know, so 20 more years from now, that lake will be destroyed <laughs> and become become all weeds. So if something, if action isn't taken now, then it will, it'll, it's only going to get drastically worse. So yeah, there's very serious, you know, it's very serious. So anyways, uh, make wedge for today. I hope everyone has safe travels home. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, um, so I just need a mover and seconder for adjournment. I shall so move. Thank you. Mover and seconder and the vote. That calls it. We're good. Thank you, everybody, and thank you all for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Good. It was good. Yeah. Oh.